A call to order the study session of the Newport Beach City Council of June 14th, 2016. Madam Clerk, roll call. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Current business, first item, clarification of items on the consent calendar. Any comments? Any members of the public, any comments? Item number two, proclamation recognizing the Newport Harbor Yacht Club Centennial. Commodore Gary Hill is here. If you'd like to come forward. I will read the proclamation. Thank you. Whereas the Newport Harbor Yacht Club was founded in 1916 and will celebrate, is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, and whereas the Newport Harbor Yacht Club continues with the tradition of providing a physical and social environment for their members and families to pursue and to perpetuate the highest ideals of yachting, yacht racing, and sportsmanship, to assure regional, national, and international leadership in the sport, and whereas the Newport Harbor Yacht Club offers local junior sailing, premier racing around the world, its members compete in all levels of junior, one design, inshore, and offshore sailing. And whereas the Newport Harbor Yacht Club continues to be listed as a Platinum Yacht Club of America, five-star club of excellence by the Club Leaders Forum, that now therefore I, Diane Brooks-Dixon, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire Newport Beach City Council, do hereby congratulate Newport Harbor Yacht Club on their 100th year anniversary. Thank you very much. I hope we can uh, continue for another 100 years to keep people on the water and bring people from all over sailing in our harbor. Thank you. Thank you. I'll present this and we'll do a photograph. All right, item number three, Medi-Cal Managed Care Rate, Rate Range Intergovernmental Transfer IGT Program. And I believe staff has something to comment on, please. Mayor Dixon, members of the council, Scott Poster, your fire chief, to update you or to provide a presentation on the uh, IGT. The Newport Beach Fire Department is a local government health care provider registered with Medi-Cal to receive reimbursement for ambulance transport of Medi-Cal eligible patients. However, the reimbursement is minimal compared to the cost of service. But we are mandated to transport patients no matter what their financial status is. The federal government, Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services, realizes the impact to health care providers and has provided an opportunity to recapture a portion of the unreimbursed costs. Our finance department and city attorney have worked with us for several months in dealing with the county and state agencies to prepare our city to participate in the reimbursement program. Tonight, we will request you to take advantage of the opportunity to obtain new funds to offset a portion of the cost required to transport Medi-Cal patients to the hospital. Angela Crespi, our administrative manager, Will provide you with, has provided you with a handout and will make a presentation and focus on several slides to explain the program. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Dixon, City Council members. Um, I'm here, as the Chief stated this evening, to give you a presentation on the Medi-Cal Managed Care Rate Range Intergovernmental Transfer Program. I'll just refer to it as program <laughs> moving forward. Um, so in your packets, you received information about the program, more detailed information, including definitions that are relative to the program, um, some brief history, and identification of other partners. Um, for this presentation, we'll focus on um, the process itself, the reasons for participation, and the potential benefits. Okay. Uh, for the, the benefits are not only for the city of Newport Beach itself, but also for the state and for the county, and we'll get into um, those a little bit later. So numerous times each year, city staff brings to city council opportunities 
to increase revenue and support programs through approval of grant agreements to receive money through federal or state funding. This program is just that. It's an opportunity to secure additional funding to offset previously unreimbursed costs for the services that we've provided to Medi-Cal patients in the fiscal year 2014-2015. Where this program differs from your typical grant program is in that it requires leveraged funds from the city of Newport Beach. You may ask yourself, why do we have unreimbursed costs for Medi-Cal services, and why is this program in existence? The reason is this, regardless of our city of Newport Beach ambulance transport fees or the cost that it costs or the cost for city of Newport Beach for providing those services, um, we accept Medi-Cal's payment as payment in full. That means that we don't bill the additional portion or the uncovered funds to the patients. In 2014-2015, Medi-Cal represented 18% of our emergency medical transports. While that's the smallest of our payers for our patients, it also is the lowest in terms of reimbursement. So for every transport that we provided that year, we've calculated that there was an average cost of $1,447. In exchange for that, we receive an average payment of $129 for Medi-Cal. So you see that leaves a very large portion unreimbursed. Given this increase in the Affordable Care Act and more Medi-Cal patients, um, the state has recognized that there's a need for programs like this to support local governments or local health care providers to cover those unreimbursed costs. This program is focused specifically on the Medi-Cal managed care patients. In Orange County, that means patients who are enrolled under Cal Optima. As you can see in the chart, the city of Newport Beach provided a total of 390 ambulance transports during the 14-15 fiscal year. For those uh, 390 transports, we estimate a total service cost of $564,000. We received payment from Medi-Cal in the amount of $50,000. So that leaves 514,000 or 91% of our cost unreimbursed. This calculated loss is the basis for our participation in the IGT program. This program will provide us the opportunity to reduce that 514,000 in unreimbursed cost by $102,000. Okay, in order to participate in the program, there are five steps. Um, the city must transfer local funds through this five-step process shown on the slide. The reason for this required transfer or leveraging of funds is due to the structure of Medicaid itself as a joint shared program between the state government and the federal government. So step one, uh, identified there in red, the city of Newport Beach would transfer local funds of approximately $308,000 to the State Department of Healthcare Services. In step two, the Department of Healthcare Services would contribute approximately $10,000 as the state's share of taxes, and then use those funds along with our local funds to draw down additional federal support. The Federal Center for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services under Step 3 would then return the original funds plus matching funds of a new money of $267,000. In Step 4, the Department of Healthcare Services would then send that money to our county, Cal Optima, um, in the amount of $535,000. As the final step, step five, um, Cal Optima would pay the required tax and then return $411,000 back to the city of Newport Beach. Now this slide, um, you know, basically shows you the participation flow in dollar amounts, actual dollar amounts. Um, I'll give you a minute to look over that and I can certainly go through each item um, if you're interested. But essentially, the program would start at the beginning with City of Newport Beach contributing $308,000. And then as we get through the five-step process, it would end with a payment back to the City of Newport Beach for $411,000, which equals your 102 of new funds. To date, city staff has completed the non-binding steps of calculating our service costs, identifying our uh, potential participation amounts, 
and developing three draft agreements with Cal Optima and the State Department of Healthcare Services. If the City Council wishes to move forward to secure this additional funding, the next step will be to sign the three draft agreements and return them back to the state by June 26th. After that takes place, we'd be looking at September 2016 to transfer the funds to the State Department of Healthcare Services with the funds coming back to the City of Newport Beach in November of 2016. Draft agreements and um, all items for your consideration are included in the consent agenda that you'll have later on this evening, but we welcome any questions that you have regarding the program. Council members, any questions? Mr. Petros. Madam Mayor, um, can you describe who comprises the 390 calls for this particular service? Are these, are these um, emergency responses that after the fact we find out they're Medi-Cal uh, patients or do we know as we start the call this is going to be a transfer and that that transfer is in fact a Medi-Cal patient? That would be correct. <clears throat> the fire department responds to an emergency medical aid and no matter what that patient is, we find out later what type of insurance they have, if any. So this is just a mix of the patients we have. That 390 people in that time frame are the Medi-Cal patients that we did transport. We, found, we find out after we are on scene or oftentimes at the hospital. Any other questions up here? Mr. Piotr, Mr. Duffield, Mr. Mayor Mokhtum. All right, why don't we take it out, any questions? Why don't we put it out to the public? Any questions from members of the public, please come forward. Seeing none, all right. So, so Madam Mayor, yes. then if there aren't council questions and or expressions of concern, uh, I'm going to leave this on the council's consent calendar for tonight. You're certainly welcome to talk about it again, but it was my intent to use this time as a chance to figure out if you're comfortable with this. And I, I would note that I'm comfortable with it enough to have put it on your agenda. Um, it's not entirely risk-free. There isn't a locked uh, ironclad guarantee that we'll get the money back. Other communities that have done this have gotten the reimbursement as requested, so I don't see that there is a significant risk, but there's nothing that, that this, this is not a risk-free transaction. I just want to make that clear. Can you, can you describe in more detail then, Mr. Kiff, what the risk is? In, our, in the documents and the agreement with them, um, so, so there's no clear description who's, that- Who's that, them? So, I'm sorry? Who is them? Um, this is with the, the state D, DCH, DHCS, as well as Cal Optima, that um, if something happens at the federal level between now and November with reimbursements, arguably the state could say we don't have the money, the federal government would say we don't have the money to match California's share. I don't see that happening politically between now and November, but certainly a year from now it could be completely different with a different Congress or a different president because um, it does have to do with the Affordable Care Act in that sense. Um, however, uh, I don't see the risk this year. And this isn't something we'd use. We would go back and revisit it each year to see whether or not the risk has changed. It's something I feel comfortable about in 2006, yet to be determined if I'd feel comfortable recommending it in 2017. Sorry, 2016, uh, yeah. 17. I'm sorry, I'm older. being a little bit thick, but I might why do they too. need our money first to give us back a greater share of money. Okay. Uh, the way that that the Medi-Cal program is set up, it's a it's a matching program between the state and the federal government. State in their budget basically has a finite amount that they're willing to participate or you know willing to spend each year on Medi-Cal services. Um, when it gets to that point, they can then use local funds like they do through this program as the state's portion of matching to draw down additional federal funds. Is the, is the percentage based uh, equivalent across communities? Do other, other communities in, in Orange County, for example, who are participating in this for 300, do they get 100 back? Yeah, the, the participation amount is based on your unreimbursed costs initially, but the percentage that they get back would be the same um, in Orange County. It's, it's based on Orange County. 
And Councilman uh, oh. Petros, one thing, the money that we are putting in is put into a fiduciary trust earmarked only for this purpose and it cannot be spent on anything else. Mr. Piatter. So let me see if I can get this straight. We're putting $308,000 of unrestricted money into Department of Healthcare Services. They're doing their magic formula and maybe there'll be money there for us to match and we get half of that totaling 108, you said? thousand dollars and then we get the hundred eight thousand plus the three hundred eight thousand back but there's no guarantee if something happens in the middle of this transit of six months it goes from now till November so in the six month transit period is there a chance we'll lose our original 308 or is it just a matter of how much and therefore just a matter of how much of the matching funds we get or is there a potential scenario under this wonderful Obamacare that we could actually not get our full 308,000 back. We have asked that question to our people in Sacramento and, the, and in the county as well. And these are government transfer, transferred funds into a fiduciary account that cannot be put anywhere else earmarked for this reason only. And as government auditing goes into play, you cannot spend funds in any other way. It's not if we're going to get or may we get money back. That money we transfer to this fiduciary trust will be returned back to us if it is not used. However, that we are not alone in this. UCI alone is putting $20 million into theirs than they have for years. There's a number of healthcare providers through California that have already taken advantage of this IGT. As a fire department, we have been accepted as a healthcare provider, which provides us the opportunity to take advantage of th the same thing that the hospitals are doing. None of them have lost any money over the years. This is not a new process, and we have never heard of any risk to us, although our city attorney does look into the contract and there is no stated agreement that they will pay no matter what. None of the other agencies involved with this have sustained any risk or had any problems, so we feel very safe in recommending this to you. And yeah, just briefly, we had requested that the ad provisions basically guaranteeing that we'd get the money back uh, or that we'd get the return of our principal, and they wouldn't agree to that. Um, so that is something that we did look at and was discussed with them. They wouldn't put it in writing, but the history has shown that that's what happens. Now, and the money that we get back is restricted, right? Yes. The entire amount. Yes, Council Member Piotr, but uh, if you look at just the amount we spend on emergency medical care, we can more than, more than cover that. In other words, use all of those funds, all those 100,000 plus the original amount, just back for emergency medical care. So I, d I don't see that as a big concern in terms of not being able to use the money. And the trust fund that you're talking about is really to use it towards Medicaid, whether it's in Newport or in San Francisco, but there's no restrictions in the trust fund that it come back to Newport. At least that's what I hear from the city attorney. So as I was giving Mr. Kiff a hard time on it, it sounds like I've got this uncle in Nigeria that wants to give you a certain amount of money, but he needs your money first. I mean, the difference is, is that we are dealing with another governmental entity. But it's just really strange that, that we're having to make this matching fund donation when we spend the money already anyway. But I guess the feds want to see it in the bank before they write a check in such are the wonders of Obamacare. Thank you. Mr. Curry. Well, uh, first of all, I want to commend staff for following up on this. Uh, it is a complicated law to be reimbursed. Uh, and health care providers who are first figuring this out have done well with it. I was in a presentation with the Anaheim Fire Department about a year and a half ago, and they were one of the leaders in figuring out how they could sort of uh, obtain greater reimbursement through this. So it's good to see that we're following up and doing this. Uh, I, I share the uh, bafflement about why it's uh, as complicated as it is, but having worked in the federal government, I understand the various requirements to leverage and to match and to show local funds first, and that's really how the programs work. So I think this is an excellent way for us to obtain some reimbursement for the costs that we've been incurring over the years, and I commend staff for following up on it. I just have a couple questions. Um, uh, Chief Poster, if, if our expenses are not reimbursed, who pays for those services provided, emergency services? The city. It comes out of our... So it comes from every... every Resident, every taxpayer. Every taxpayer, yes. But, but then it's spread across the entire city. Okay, num number two. Um, 
how many years have these other agencies, entities been participating in this program? This is not a new program. No. Do you know the year started? Um, UCI has been participating in Orange County since 2011, I believe. So they've had several years of participation behind them. Have you spoken? Has, have you spoken with them to understand their experience and best practice in dealing? this agency? I haven't been able to reach anyone at UCI um, that works specifically on the IGT. When you when you call different local governments and Well, you have checked them. with other agencies. I guess that's yes. a better question. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. No further questions. Does uh, Mr. Muldoon, Mayor Pro Tem. Did the uh, proportion of reimbursement used to be larger before uh, the ARRA was passed? Or I'm sorry, affordable health care was passed? No. No, I... I I don't have any indication that it was ever larger before. Um, it is larger in other counties outside of Orange County uh, because we have the county organized health care system, Cal Optima, which retains 50% of the drawn down funds. So that is something that's unique to Orange County. Um, but it would be the same for all communities. So essentially, it's always been a pretty low amount that we got back. And now, because of money sh being shuffled around in Washington, we get federal um, reimbursements or subsidies, essentially. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Being none. All right. Mr. Giff. Thank you for listening on that one. I appreciate it. So we'll leave that on the consent calendar for tonight. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, item number four, vessel sewage pump out program for mooring permittees. Sounds like a tongue twister. Uh, we have Mr. Miller here. And Mr. Webb. Yes, good evening, Mayor Wood. Chris gets ready here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to take this for tonight. Um, we've uh, heard your calls in the past. Council's requested ways to add amenities to our mooring permit system. So Chris is here to explain and uh, go over a program that we think you may like. Okay, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm here to talk about a pilot program to provide complimentary vessel sewage pump out service for our offshore mooring permittees. Council Member Duffy and I brainstormed on this idea and, and uh, worked on it for a, f a few months ago, then I've taken it and um, developed this program that we have here this evening. Basically, it would provide a convenience amenity to mooring permittees and renting visitors. And, and the concept is we will come to you and pump out your boat rather than having them go to our uh, local stations on public piers. We feel this will further promote water quality by removing or reducing, ho hopefully removing the temptation to illegally discharge in the harbor. Uh, it'll also prolong the life of our existing pump out stations, which are, re they do require a lot of maintenance and we spend a lot of time uh, keeping those up and running for the public. It also helps the council goals to improve amenities for mooring permittees and hopefully it'll improve some boating um, and get the people out to use their boats. For, for reference, here are our five stations at four locations. These are city-maintained pump-out uh, facilities that are uh, tied to public piers as well as the Balboa Yacht Basin, located in four different places throughout the harbor. The, the program is, is fairly simple. Um, a mooring permittee would call one of the services. One of the services would come out to their boat and they would pump out their vessel and then that service would invoice the city once a month. And included with that invoice would be the mooring, name, vessel, and gallons pumped. Uh, we're proposing three pump outs per vessel per month so that we can keep the program in check and to avoid abuse. Uh, the um, proposed rate that was uh, agreed upon or to be agreed upon with the two companies through an RFP process, which I'll describe in a moment, was, would be $27.50 per pump out. So the companies would keep track of how many people they pumped out in, in a given month and then submit an invoice to the city. They wouldn't be responsible for fresh water flushing or head repairs. Uh, there'd be a trip charge if there was a cancel, cancellation. And of course, only vessels that have external deck fittings um, so that they could, they could easily pump out their vessels would be part of the program. And most boats have that. We sent out two requests, for, we sent out a request for a proposal and we have two companies in the harbor and they both responded. They, and that's how we came out with a rate of $27.50. We took an average of uh, both their responses. 
Our proposal would be to contract with each of those companies for $25,000 and have it uh, last until the funds deplete or one year. I would hope that the funds would deplete well before the one year, which would s indicate that people are using it. And then, of course, we'd review the effectiveness of the program uh, throughout to determine, A, if it should be continued or, or not. And lastly, I've, I've asked the uh, good folks at the Bay Foundation, which is a group that mostly works in the LA area, but they do come down here every now and then. They, they sponsor various programs. It's called the Honeypot Programs in, in certain harbors, and basically it's free pump-out services. And so they already have some artwork, and they can easily develop a flyer. I'm not a good artist, so um, they were happy to um, provide that service for us. They're working on that now. We'd also include notices to the, all the mooring permittees to try and publicize it. Um, we might ask the Harbor Patrol to distribute flyers. Of course, it'd be on our city website. And uh, when available, it uh, might be part of our software, which we would use for managing, um, managing the moorings. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And I'm really looking this evening for some feedback from the council and, and uh, some direction on whether or not we should think about pursuing this. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, Mr. Duffield? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to add a couple of things. One of the items that we uh, <clears throat> kind of motivated us to look into this a little further was that a lot of the times, most of the time, sadly, our equipment is down on those docks. Those pump outs are quite delicate and they um, tend to uh, be abused in, in some ways and um, fail to operate. So it's uh, it's kind of one of those things where you get there and it doesn't work and you know, oh God, you had to go back and find another one and so you end up not doing it and it discourages people. Um, they do a good job, Maud does, of, of keeping as much as it running as they can, but it, it remains to be a challenge and it's very expensive to fix them. But the parts are 800 bucks a shot and, and so that was one way to alleviate it. A um, couple of things though since I, I've been thinking about this, and this is a study session, I hope, um, that maybe it not be free. Maybe just a, a slight, you know, a good discount, heavily discounted, just so they have some skin in the game so they don't abuse it. Because you've got liveaboards are going to use it a lot more, and, and even though the three-time rule, but the other people, um, you know, in the winter time, you're not you're not boating at all, so they're, the liveaboards get a huge advantage, and uh, so I think it might might be an idea to think about. And then, and then secondly, I would suggest uh, sending this off to the Harbor Commission. I have heard some of the mooring folks um, want to chime in on some suggestions, ideas, and so on and so forth. And um, I would think that might be uh, a very appropriate. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Salich. Yeah, I am in favor of moving ahead on something like this, whether it's a small charge or whatever, and give it a give it a uh, a test to see how it works. Um, be a good way to uh, you know help keep the harbor cleaner than it is. And you know it's tough if you're on a mooring to go to these pump out stations. And like you say, I've come up to a few of them when they're not working and ended up going three miles out. And um, so in favor of uh, you know moving ahead with it. Uh, Mr. Curry. Well, I share uh, Mr. Duffield's view that we ought to uh, find a way to charge for this service. We did cut the mooring fees by $500,000, and 60% uh, of that benefit goes to people who don't live in the city. So presumably, 60% of the benefit of this $50,000 we would spend here would go to people who don't live in the city. And as we get ready to uh, adopt the budget tonight, I expect we'll hear a lot of discussion about our ability to afford the kinds of things that we want to do. And one of the ways that we can preserve the affordability of things is by not giving away things for free, particularly to non-residents. So I'd like to see us develop a fee schedule for this. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good service for the harbor. It's a good service to keep the harbor clean. But uh, we need to take into account uh, some of the benefits that have already been provided to mooring holders, and not in including the fee cuts, and the ability to have multiple transfers of, of the mooring itself where they pocket the, the profit on a public asset to the tune of Thirty and forty thousand dollars sometimes. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. 
Thank you. Yeah, this is a great benefit to the city to stop pollutants, obviously. Uh, I think I just agree with Councilman Duffield. We could let the Harbor Commission decide this, and I think the city manager could just do a signature on these small contract amounts. I would assume defer to the Harbor Commission. Thank you. Mr. Piotr. I agree with Councilman Muldoon as well. I'd like to see the Harbor Commission do it. I like the idea of some sort of a copay, even if it's five bucks, so that people don't randomly uh, uh, use it. Uh, maybe the idea of the $15 cancellation fee gets charged to somebody's credit card and then credit them back 10 bucks or whatever, assuming that they come through with it. Thank you. And uh, I agree with uh, a good program, and we should uh, probably get some shared skin in the game. Uh, I guess I need to refer it out to the public. Any members, anybody else have a comment up here? No? Uh, any members of the public would like to make a comment on this? Yes, Mr. Hill. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I had no idea we were doing this. Gary Hill, 503 Kings Road, if you need that. Um, I think this is great. Uh, number one, I think you're really going to find out from the bookkeeping of this uh, who's actually using it. And I think that's really important. I think we really want to find out if these liveaboards are using the pump out service or any type of pump out service. So I think uh, we should go forward with this and it would be fabulous since I deal with the liveaboards every day. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Yep. Uh, Carter Ford, Mooring Permittee, and uh, member of the NMA board. We've done our best to collect input so we could share a little bit with you. We were caught by surprise in that um, we learned recently, and we thank uh, Chris for sharing that this was going to be coming up. They attempted to hear it at the last Harbor Commission meeting and weren't able to because of various recusement issues. So it didn't get any discussion there, which would, I think, have been a wonderful thing. Uh, to, somewhat to our surprise, um, we're definitely getting feedback that uh, raises significant questions and, and therefore rather than tie you all up with them um, the NMA's greatest concurrence of all the people that did give us feedback would be please send it the Harbor Commission is what they're tasked with and it has potential to be a great program certainly there should be skin in the game I think that's a personally a good point but um, there is a tendency for a free program first of all they're not free we all know that the taxpayers are paying for this um, and the, by the way, the moored boats are a relatively small percentage of the total of boats in the harbor that have um, heads on them and hopefully holding tanks. So that's another factor, all the boats and marinas and private docks. So uh, bottom line, I uh, hope you can send it to Harbor Commission so that the more additional brainstorming to um, fine tune this uh, could be done. And we f avoid maybe taking a step that would be potentially as free programs tend to do, become larger and permanent, let's uh, be careful with it at the beginning. So we hope you go to the uh, Harbor Commission. Thank you. All right, thank you. Did you want to speak before a public comment? I just have a question for Councilmember Duffy. Was this meant just to be for mooring permittees or anybody? Mooring permittees, okay. Any other members of the public wish to speak? Please come forward. Seeing none, all right. Um, Mr. Kiff, Mr. Webb, Mr. Miller, I think you have some good direction referring it to the Harbor Commission and having some copay part of the system. So thank you. Thank you. Very much, all right. Next item, number five, uh, council input on city self-certification of water regulations. So Mr. Murdoch. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor, Mem or afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, George Murdoch, Municipal Operations. Um, at the last meeting, we briefly discussed the State Board's extension of the emergency drought regulations through 2017 and new regulations that allow water agencies to self-certify a conservation standard uh, in light of the improved conditions of uh, water supply in Northern California. The new state certification process requires the agencies to identify the average 2013 and 14 water demands and estimate the supply needs if the drought was to continue for three additional years. If an agency, for instance, has adequate supply to meet demands, then the, the mandatory conservation standard would be zero. On the other hand, if an agency has a shortfall of 10%, then the mandatory state conservation standard would be 10%. 
As you know, we receive all our water from two wholesale agencies, the Orange County Water District, who provides our groundwater supplies, and our import supplies from the Metropolitan Water District through the wholesale agency of the Municipal Water District of Orange County. All Orange County agencies have provided estimated demands for the next three years to the wholesale agencies, and the emergency order requires these agencies to provide their supply abil abilities uh, to the retail agencies, us and others, uh, by June 15th, which is just tomorrow. Each agency then must submit a f on a form. Uh, the State Water Board has a, a website up uh, to uh, submit the, their supply conditions, their estimated demands, and a self-certification of the conservation standard. The State Board will not accept ex certifications after June 22nd, and agencies that do not submit documents will remain at their current level. So Orange County Water District has already provided supply information and has stated that in a continued drought, uh, they could supply enough water to meet the city's demands uh, up to 70% of the city's demands. Um, the Metropolitan Water District has not yet supplied, uh, provided the numbers. Uh, they intend to do this by tomorrow, the 15th, but have indicated that they believe that they will also be able to meet um, the 30% uh, estimated demands that we would need from our import supplies. So with all that said, um, uh, if when we fill out this form and both agencies could meet our supply demands over the next three years, the self-certification number would be zero. But one thing to keep in mind is that the zero means that at a minimum the city would need to conserve enough water to not exceed that same amount of water used in 2013. So for several months the city has struggled in meeting our conservation standard, if you recall. From June 15, 2015 to February 2016, our cumulative average only reached 20%. Starting in March of 2016, our standard was lowered from 28% to 21%. Due to increased enforcement and cooler temperatures, we've seen a significant reductions in the last three months, bringing our cumulative average to 22%, just over the state standard. Our customers should be applauded for their efforts to get us to that goal. Many agencies, even if they select a zero state mandated standard, Many local agencies have elected to keep some conservation level in place at the local level, um, as long as the emergency state regulations are in place. In our case, we're currently at a level three mandatory water conservation requirement, which requires a 25% reduction and a restriction of irrigation to two days a week in the summer and one day a week in the winter. Staff believes that in light of the conditions, council could elect to lower the level to a level two or level one a level two meaning that there would be a conservation standard somewhere between 10 and 25% and uh, allow irrigation for three days a week in the summer and one day a week in the winter. A level one would require reductions in the range of zero to 10% and allow irrigation of four days a week in the summer and two days a week in the winter. Council could elect to have no conservation level at all, but it should be noted that we will report this number to the state monthly and it might be difficult to increase conservation if the city does not meet their goals. State Board Chair Felicia Marcus has said that the drought conditions are far from over, but have improved enough to, set back, to step back from the top-down target setting. Agencies need to demonstrate that they are prepared for three more years. Continued monthly reporting will show us what agencies plan to do and how they plan to do it. Uh, she said that we, they will trust, but verify. In the meantime, the State Board will be watching and prepared to come back with a 25% state mandate early next year if necessary. With all that said, we're, we would welcome comments from the Council or a direction from Council or thoughts on what we, you think that our level could be, if we, whether it be zero or we could be a 10% or change that level of conservation. With that, we'd love to have any input. Okay, Mr. Petros. Thank yeah. you, George. George, I don't know if I've got any direction. I, I think I, I would like to propose a conundrum. Um, I receive a number of, of correspondence from um, citizens in Newport that constantly uh, suggest how can we continually approve projects, bringing in new neighbors, new businesses, and ask the existing neighbors to cut their water use. With that as my banner, I, I, my issue is 
this notion of defining what demand is. You've said it's a three-year, you know, or, or the state has said it's a three-year uh, demand threshold, and that it's based on a 2013 emergency drought criteria. That's the bright white line. But we are charged with uh, seeing our general plan through to its ultimate vision. And that has with it a whole host of new projects, new population growth, new employment, new economic vitality that has a demand on water. How do I sit up here and tell you what this conservation level should be for three years when I'm also tasked with seeing the 2006 general plan to completion? How do I let you know what that is? I don't know if it's level one, two, or three. I don't know if it ought to be a 1.5 or, or some other thing. Is there some direction that staff can do to look at what our general plan says is, is our trajectory based on current absorption in dwelling units in square footage of commercial use? Give me a straight line. I know it's, it's fuzzy. I know this is very, very fuzzy. But if I were to say, okay, here's the trajectory of growth in this city as estimated based on our current trajectory, and I'm going to bring in this much more of the general plan over three years, five years, 10 years, then at least I can tell you, here's what my anticipated need for water is for everybody, my existing residents and the new that's gonna come forward. And then I can tell you with a little bit better crystal ball about what I think our conservation goal should be. Absent that, I'm shooting in the dark. I don't know. I know if you tell me, well, it's based on 2013, sure. But we're in 2016 now, and we've already had a number of initiatives that we have approved. I'd like to see something a little more science put in this so that I can give you better direction based on absorption of our general plan, I think is what I'm asking for. Mr. Selich. Um, I don't know where it should uh, go, but it seems to me that um, probably we should be looking at maybe dropping it down one level. I mean, that's kind of where just intuitively, but I don't have any facts to back that up, just kind of an intuitive feel about what's going on, maybe drop it down one level. I don't think we can quit conserving and go down to zero. Going down two levels seems a little, maybe a little much at this time. So based on what you're saying, that's kind of where I'd fall, I think. Any other comments from council members? Seeing none, let's go to the public. Any public comments, please come forward. Seeing none, we'll come back up here. Any other comments? So what's on the table here? We'll bring it down one, and Mr. Petros is saying, how do we calibrate in or factor in all the development and buildings since 2013? So in this monthly, the monthly reporting will continue through the end of January 2017. And in that monthly report, we do, they do allow us to adjust for population. Uh, if you recall when our percentage went from 28% to 21, the state did allow for new developments or uh, adjustments based on any kind of growth. Um, I don't know if we would see that between now and January, uh, but we can adjust population. So there is a little bit of you know, um, a wiggle room from the state. Um, the number zero, I mean, what we're hearing from our wholesalers is they have adequate supplies. So the state mandate would be zero, but maybe, um, what I'm hearing around the county is that everybody's fearful if we go to a zero locally that people are just, it's, you know, free for all watering and we'll overshoot that target even compared to 2013. And why they picked 13, I don't know. But 13 is the number the governor picked. So most folks are going into that 10%, 5 to 10% range saying let's keep some sort of regulation in place and let the state show the state that we're performing that we acknowledge the governor's emergency order. We still respect that they, there's a drought in place, um, rather, you know, and perform to that five to 10% in, the, in case we do go into an extended drought. Remember, locally, you can adjust that number 
as much as you would like. It's confusing to the public, so we wouldn't want to do it too much. But we could try a number and then see how we do over a period of a couple of months, and we can adjust that number. Uh, that would be maybe one recommendation. George? Is a level two conservation effort equivalent to about a 10% conservation? Uh, the level two does. Um, let me get the exact number for you. So, so a level two uh, would be 10 to 25% reduction. So 10 would be the, the, the lowest number. The irrigation days go to three days a week and one day you know, in the summer and one day in the winter. Um, the level one does allow you to go from zero to 10%, so you're still at that 10% range. I think at the irrigation days, there's something that we are definitely have to be careful about. Um, I see a lot of agencies go into three to four days a week. Uh, Mesa, in fact, was in the paper allowing them to do whatever they want to do, which could get you in trouble some quickly. Um, so, so yes, it's a level two, level one. Uh, if you want to go below 10%, you would have to go to a level one. Mr. Duffield. I, I tend to agree with Councilman Selge's suggestion of level one. Two. Up down the Two or one? Up down one level. The, the oh, 10 yeah. to 25, Councilmember Duffield, that concept? Any other comments up here? We might note, George, you can fill, it, fill me in here. There are a number of restrictions that remain with the governor's order, and I think those restrictions help us. So could you say what remains? Sure. So um, in, the, in the restrictions which, will, which remain permanent, and I don't touch on all those, are the permanent restrictions that we already have in our municipal code. So that's the, uh, there's no more irrigation of uh, turf with potable drinking water. Those will remain in place. Um, the same thing about hosing sidewalks and washing a car, you must have a nozzle. All those remain in place no matter what level we have. We do meet the state goals there. Uh, we don't have anything in our municipal code that says that you can't um, irrigate center medians in private communities, but that's something that the Public Works Department's been working with those folks on. Uh, we might think about that in the future, but um, there are plenty of restrictions that help us get there. Um, I think it's the irrigation days and, of course, the mandatory percentage, that, the big goals. Mr. Petros. Yeah. I, I have two. For the purpose of a three-year forecast, I would support Mr. Selich on that. But I would like to see something come back on consent as a receive and file, even if it's simply from the EIR for the general plan, about what was the assumed water usage for the build-out of our general plan. Can we do that so that when the public says, why are you doing what you're doing when you're asking me to, to cut back? There's an answer to that. Mr. Piotr. I agree. Let's take it down one notch. What, be more specific. What are we saying? To one? One level down, like Mr. Selge is oh. suggesting. Um, so what's the next step? Uh, we're going to come back with a recommendation. You'll come back with a recommendation to council. Right. So um, to move a level, we, could, we would adopt it by a resolution. So we would come back to you perhaps at the next meeting uh, recommending a level two. I must, I'm not hearing a percent exactly, but a 10% or something around there um, at a level two. We would do it by resolution for your approval, and it would take effect after that. Okay. Mr. Kipp, Mr. Murdoch, do you have your thoughts? Okay. Thank you. Nope, Appreciate that. All right. Uh, that's the end of that. Madam Clerk. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The city council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are invited on items listed on the agenda and non-agenda items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The city council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. All right, we will be in recess until, oh, was there any public comment? <laughs> no? All right. I'm sorry? No? No public comment? No public comment? No. Okay. Going once. Uh, so we are in recess until 7 p.m.?
The regular meeting of the Newport Beach City Council, June 14th, 2016, has now been reconvened. Madam Clerk? The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Please uh, rise as we do the Pledge of Allegiance, by, led by Councilman Piotr, and we will follow the Pledge of Allegiance by a moment of silence for the atrocity in Orlando and the unspeakable atrocity in Orlando, followed by our invocation by Rabbi Robin Funberg of the Congregation of B'nai Israel. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Today is Flag Day. I don't know if you know that, but 239 years ago today, in 1777, the Continental Congress passed a resolution that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, and the Union be 13 stars, white and a blue field, representing a new constellation. Since that time, generations of Americans have celebrated the flag as our symbol of our God-given freedoms and God-blessed nation. And in every American military campaign, Old Glory has been a symbol of our unique American freedoms and ideals. Uh, please join me as we say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. offering that moment of silence. Thank you for uh, the honor of speaking and addressing me this evening. I may be the only rabbi in Orange County that actually grew up in Orange County. I consider Irvine to be my home. I also lived in Santa Ana and Westminster and Rancho San Antonio. Excuse me, could you stand in front of the microphone? Today I live in Long Beach, but just over the border into LA County, which is about as far as into LA County I want to go, and I work in Tustin, um, my parents still live in Irvine. I always tell people that I could not imagine living anywhere else. Let's face it, we live in paradise. Newport Beach, with its beautiful beaches, its perfect weather, lovely hills and parks, not to mention the great shopping and restaurants. Why would anyone want to live anywhere else? And it's also safe. Irvine has been voted one of the safest cities in the country over and over again. As a kid, I would ride my bike all the way from Irvine down to the beach, 17th Street on the peninsula. I would ride the OCTA to the South Coast Plaza or to Balboa to ride the car ferry. I grew up here in Orange County never worrying about my safety. But today, sadly, we are all worried about our safety. We worry for our kids, and we would never let them ride the bus alone. And we would never let them ride their bikes to the beach. And now today, we have to worry about even worse things. We have to worry about movie theaters and dance clubs, and even worse yet, our classrooms. My hope, my dream, my prayer for all of us is simply to feel safe again. Our homes are our sanctuaries. Our cities are our backyards. Our houses of worship are, are our important gathering places for fellowship, spiritual guidance, and uplift. In the aftermath, of the mass murder in Orlando. May we all work together to keep each other safe. May we know that our neighbors have our backs, that the village is helping to care for our children, and that our city officials and first responders have the resources they need to help all of us in an emergency. 
May we all continue to grow in our understanding and our acceptance of others. And may we all continue to heal and to love. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Notice to the public, the city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The City Council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for City Council announcements. Mr. Petros. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, uh, the past couple of weeks have really kind of been a roller coaster. Uh, the, I have a couple of announcements. First, I was... Uh, <clears throat> I was honored to uh, participate in the Brock McCann Memorial Walk. Uh, Brock was a young man who uh, lost his life when he was riding home from school and was hit by a, a trash truck. Uh, it was a wonderful event. Uh, heaven now has a new angel, a new saint, and he will look down on us, I'm sure. The rest of the weekend uh, had a better note to it. I had the opportunity to go to and uh, join by Madam Mayor uh, to the Newport Harbor High School Jazz Picnic, where our high school students put on quite a show under, again, our beautiful Newport Beach climbs. There was a barbecue, and it was a great afternoon. And then finally, um, more evidence, I guess this would be the bow on the, the final uh, project, the picture. More evidence, uh, Councilman Duffield, that in fact the sewer project is finished. The, uh, the medians along Coast Highway from Newport Boulevard to Superior are now planted. They are complete. They are beautiful. This is uh, work done as the final phase of the sewer project that you, the residents, have endured for the last two years. Uh, this was part of the contract that the OC Sand District uh, completed. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman Curry for just uh, his stewardship over this. Uh, this is also what we could expect when the citizens' uh, advisory panel proposal for the medians uh, west of Superior uh, is uh, uh, approved by this council. Uh, this is the type of landscape that we'll see uh, completing Coast Highway through Newport Beach. So uh, congratulations, Dave. Congratulations, staff and uh, the motoring public. There is relief. Mr. Curry. Mayor. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was uh, privileged to represent the city on Thursday when the Association of California Cities, Orange County, gave us another one of the Golden Hub of Innovation Awards, uh, this one for staffing and service delivery for uh, version 2.0 of our one-stop permitting center uh, for building permits uh, in the city. Uh, the 1.0 was when we redesigned and moved into this city hall and we put everything behind one desk and gave people the opportunity to go in and process their permits in one stop, in one place, uh, here in the new City Hall. Uh, 2.0, we, which we won this award for, uh, gives us uh, the option to now improve the quality of service through uh, having people have the option of using a private sector vendor to process their applications if they wanted to. Uh, they can pay a slightly higher fee and have their, their, their permits uh, processed in a five-day period, reducing the delay. Uh, they can also apply for their permits through the I-Permit process, do it online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, to make life fa make things faster. Uh, we also moved uh, the fire department uh, uh, permit check uh, to with the building department, so it's all behind the same desk in the new city hall. Uh, and as part of that, we we incorporated that service uh, into the building department at a savings of two hundred fifty thousand dollars to the city. And it's good to see how our uh, fellow uh, colleagues uh, in city government throughout Orange County have recognized the quality of service and the advancement that we've made in improving the quality of service to our residents here in Newport Beach. So I just want to recognize and commend staff and our city manager 
and our uh, Department of uh, Community Development who have been leaders in this area in making this a much better service for those who use it and much easier to use for those who use it. And I would also add that the Sanitation District won a comparable award for their outreach related to our project in Newport Beach for the uh, uh, sewer project. So uh, mm -hmm. we were two for Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salich. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> well, on June the 4th, I attended the, uh, along with some other council members, the uh, third annual Balboa Yacht Club Wooden Boat Festival. Um, it was a terrific event. There were 53 wooden boats there, and the, um, uh, there were boats from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even some modern wooden boats, and uh, it's really turning to be a good uh, annual event for the city. And uh, my wife's ex-boat was there, the Mei Wen-Ti reproduction of a Chinese junk, and it won uh, People's Choice Award for the best boat over 48 feet. And um, I think I said last time that I, that I asked her to sell it before we got married because of the cost to maintain it. It's actually because it was bigger than my boat. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, the next day on June the 5th, um, we had the Balboa Island Parade, and again, the entire city council was there. Uh, the Balboa Island Improvement Association should be congratulated for putting on this community event. It's a lot of work. It's, as I've said many times, it's the only parade I'm aware of where the parade itself is longer than the parade route. But it's about an hour and a half of enjoyment, uh, everything from um, the... Uh, Balboa Island uh, women's patio chair drill team to the USC band. So we had a lot of cars. It was a, a great event. Then on June the 9th, I attended with, again, I think the whole city council, the employees' annual service luncheon. And I'm sure the mayor will have something to say about that. But I just wanted to say from my own standpoint, thank you to all of our city employees uh, for all the hard work that you do for the city. It's certainly appreciated by all of us on the city council. On the 11th, I attended the Little Balboa Island Association. They have a series of meetings over the summer and brought them up to date on what's going on with the uh, city activities. And then lastly, yesterday, June the 13th, we uh, had a ribbon cutting. We had some slides coming up here. We had a ribbon cutting for the uh, temporary bridge over Balboa, uh, over the Grand Canal on Balboa Island. It's the, a big bridge for Little Island. And so we had to do a ribbon cutting for this is the temporary bridge while we're building the new bridge. It's on Balboa Avenue. So there's the mayor and a few of the council members cutting the ribbon. And then we uh, had the uh, ceremonial first cars driving over. So uh, myself and the little yellow car and council member Piotr and the big gray truck um, had the honor of being the first two cars over on the new bridge. Uh, there's, <laughs> and uh, council member Piotr is not pushing my car. I yeah. you, so. <laughs> it looks I like he's going to eat it. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. And here we are after, the, after we uh, cut the ribbon. We went up to the uh, existing Park Avenue bridge to do a groundbreaking. We had some jackhammers there and shovels, and we're getting ready to start breaking the bridge up. And hopefully it will be done uh, early next year. It'll be a little bit of inconvenience for the folks on Balboa Island, but it'll be a worthwhile project because we'll have a bridge there that'll be good for another 100 years. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Mr. Piatter, any, Mr. Duffield. Okay. So uh, we've had this kind of ongoing little thing. <laughs> this was taken this morning at the uh, intersection of the road that you were saying was completely done. So it's really close now, but not <laughs> quite. <laughs> you just happen Once to have a picture of that? Down to one lane, but I'm sure it was for the landscaping. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's done now. It wasn't it was us, I promise. Landscape. It must have been the district or something. <laughs> Look at this morning. You just happen to have that. <laughs> Any more comments? No? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. Thank you. Uh, was also at the employee appreciation lunch, which was a nice event. And um, I had a much more engaging weekend than uh, the regular lunch we had. We were invited by the fire department, council members, and I was joined by Councilman Piotr and Mayor Dixon to do Fire Ops 101, where we ran into a fake burning building, put out a car fire, and used the jaws of life. I am incredibly sore, and uh, I have a renewed respect for our fire and paramedics. Um, as a former prosecutor, I always had a you know, understanding and serious respect for our law enforcement, but 
I've seen another side of our public safety that I've never seen. So I want to thank our fire for that and the chief as well for that experience and for your service. Thank you. Okay, I have a, a number of announcements to catch up on uh, the last few weeks. Just to uh, echo what we've been saying about the uh, wonderful event last week, the Employee Appreciation Luncheon, and members of the council, we were all there to physically and personally demonstrate our support for the employees. Uh, the annual event is when we recognize employees celebrating their milestone anniversaries of their employment with the city and honor employees for their outstanding accomplishments. And we also want to uh, thank the Newport Chamber and the Commodores for actually providing the luncheon for the employees. So it's a true community event. Uh, the city manager presented two groups of employees with teamwork awards, one for their efforts on Marina Park and the other for their work on the city's new enterprise resource planning system. Uh, he, Mr. Kiff also presented a special recognition award for the team that brought the Newport Beach Animal Shelter from council, uh, concept to fruition. And also uh, an annual highlight was the announcement of the 2016 Dorothy Palin Employee of the Year Award. Dorothy, who retired in 1993, who worked for Newport Beach for 47 years, still comes back to the annual luncheon. And she sat at my table, and she's a lovely, lovely woman, and still going strong. Her namesake award recognizes an employee that exemplifies Dorothy's spirit of of cooperation, dependability, initiative, integrity, and judgment. Congratulations to Animal Control Supervisor Valerie Schomburg for being named this year's Dorothy Palin Award recipient. So congratulations again to Valerie. Uh, just to echo, just I have we have some photos here of our day at the fire station. And this was no day at the beach, I will say that it was not a picnic. We really worked hard, and those uniforms, uh, those outfits was weigh about 20 pounds, and with the air tank on the back is another 20 pounds, so it's, there's a lot of respect that we all have, and greater respect that we have for our important firefighters and medical personnel that, that serve us so well. But it was a great day, a total immersion into the jaws of life, a burning building, a burning car, and also the paramedic emergency medical services. Very enlightening. So thank you again, Chief Poster. You're out there somewhere. Thank you. And your fine team, your battalion team members, I see you out there. Thank you again for planning such an extraordinary day for all of us. Uh, this coming sa uh, Saturday, the Newport Beach City Arts Commission will host the 52nd Annual Newport Beach Art Exhibition, June 18th from 1 to 6, right here at the Civic Center. And it's a juried art exhibit and sale and features artists from throughout Southern California. And our Mayor Pro Tem will actually be one of the judges, I believe. So, so enjoy that. Um, I think I did that one, an Employee Service Awards, Fire Ops. Okay, um, Newport Beach. One other, one other announcement, um, short-term lodging. Uh, community Development has asked me to make this announcement. They will be hosting next Tuesday, June 21st, another community meeting on short-term lodging. And we'll discuss possible amendments to the municipal code to ensure the regulations are meeting the needs of the community. And this is open to all residents, property managers, and other stakeholders encouraged to attend and provide feedback to staff so this can come before in a future study session as well as uh, recommendations to the council. It will be held across here in the, co in the community room. And uh, next Tuesday, June 21st at 5.30 p.m. Okay, and finally, uh, I, I would like to recognize and extend best wishes to Crystal McDonald, our deputy city clerk, who will be leaving the city of Newport Beach after almost 10 years to be chief deputy city clerk. That's a nice promotion for the city of Carson. Crystal joined the city of Newport Beach in 2006, She's been with us for 10 years as a part-time office assistant in the city attorney's office, and her role has expanded over these years with a number of promotions, well-deserved promotions to her current role as deputy city clerk. We wish Crystal well in her new endeavors and appreciate her years of service and high level of professionalism in her job duties. Best wishes, Crystal. We will miss you. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk.
Public comments on consent calendar. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion, items one through 22. Public comments are invited on consent calendar for members of the audience. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the council members vote on the motion unless members of the city council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right, Mr. Petros. Mr. Curry. Mr. Selich? I have no items. Mr. Piotr? I'd like to pull number eight and number 20, please. Mr. Duffield? I have none. Mayor Pro Tem? Aye. None. All right, and I am going to pull item number four, subsection four, six, and seven, resolutions number 70, 71, and 72. I am pulling these to combine with item 32, uh, which is uh, later on in the agenda under current business and under the mayor's prerogative discretion, I would like to combine these two items for our discussion now and bring them forward. These items both address the need for voter approval of special taxes and a new non-bonded non debt as well as various other financial particulars and should be addressed together. Uh, as I said, both these items relate to financial governance and they need to be vetted by our finance committee before these proposals are put on a ballot. Neither the two-thirds vote on new taxes nor the non-bonded debt item uh, was vetted by the finance committee and exposed to in-depth public debate and discussion. Uh, to my knowledge, and I've had this confirmed, there has been no council approved special tax imposed on residents in over 50 years or in anyone's memory. And uh, I do not believe any such tax increase is likely to see the light of day, particularly between now and November 2016. So I do not believe there's a, a need to put it, uh, such a matter uh, on the November ballot this year before the Finance Committee has had a chance to look at it. If the Finance Committee and the public believe the City Council is inclined uh, to rush to pass new taxes on our residents in the next few years, then we can consider this matter for the 2018 ballot which I would support doing. Neither item um, has been exposed to public debate, and I think that's important at this time. And indeed, the Finance Committee may identify the need for more protections for our residents and to create better governance. Uh, so that is uh, my motion to, I move to combine those two items for our discussion now to advance that as a polled item. All right, if I make a motion uh, as a point of order, let me know if it conveys what you're saying. Um, I'm going to move the balance of the consent calendar, items 1 through 22, with clarifications on items 17 and 20, uh, with uh, item 4, subsections 4, 6, and 7, uh, pulled to be combined with the later item, discussed immediately after this motion, and items 8 and 20, pulled by Councilman Piotr. And that's uh, your motion? Yes. Second. Point of, point of order, Mr. City Attorney, can we do this? So I, I think the first thing we should do is take comments on the consent calendar and uh, approve the rest, then we can deal with the items that have been pulled from the consent calendar. Which is his motion, correct? Right, we just need public comment. Okay. Thank you. All right, any public comments on the consent calendar? Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. B before the pullings of those items we had tonight, tw 22 items on the consent calendar to, to be processed in a single vote. It's a, a lot of reading, so I wanted to call your attention to two of the items that are in here. Uh, first one I wanted to call your attention to is number 11, which involves our cash-strapped and uh, quickly going bankrupt sewer operation in the city, and item number 11 is a request for you to authorize spending $500,000 for a sewer cleaning truck. What is interesting about this is the competition for the truck was conducted by an outside agency. 
and a neighboring sewer district, the Costa Mesa sewer district, looking at those same set of proposals, chose that this involves spending $500,000 for the truck that the city chose. Costa Mesa Sanitary District from that same list apparently chose a larger unit for $170,000 less. So one wonders when we're having trouble funding our sewer system, why we're buying premium overpriced equipment for it. The second item I wanted to bring your attention to is item number 11, uh, 19, sorry, that was 11, 19, is three requests for dining on the public sidewalk near the intersection of PCH and MacArthur. Uh, th this is an item that has more than a whiff of feeding at the public trough to kind of action that breeds distrust in government. In this case, an appointed city official, a bid board appointee, promoted the taxpayers spending $500,000 for widening the sidewalk, <clears throat> voted on that recommendation to you, and now no, which was the purpose of which was to create an increased public space there. No sooner is the concrete dry than that widened space that the public paid for is requesting to take that away and have it become a permanent part of his restaurant. I, I noticed the city council is very scrupulous about not voting on things that affect them differently than the rest of the public, and I am really distressed that when that happens at a lower level, the city council or the recommendation from the staff appears to ignore that. There seem to be no consequences for having such conflicts. Thank you. Any other comments on the consent calendar? Please come forward. Hi, my name is Bellamy Walker and this is for item number 19. My husband and I live at 606 Carnation Avenue and we would really like to see the outdoor seating approved by city council because we would like additional dining options in the village because we'd like to stay there and spend our dollars there. And we think this would offer more diversity to be able to sit on the patio as opposed to sitting in the inside and not have to leave to go to Babuah Island or Lido and spend money. So we just want to give our input into that. And thank you for your consideration in this matter. Thank you. Any other public comments on consent? Seeing none, all right. Madam Mayor, if I could make one clarification yes. to what Mr. Mosier asked about item 11. So um, the good question, why would we be spending more? Uh, the reason is simple. It's that we're asking for a, a, a CNG truck, which is about $100,000 more. So Costa Mesa Sanitary mm. doesn't have the same requirement we do because we have a much larger fleet. So you have to explain what CNG is. I'm sorry, compressed natural gas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Piotr. Um, so we have we have a much larger fleet where we're subject to the AQMD requirements. And then um, secondarily, we actually do have to have a smaller truck. And sometimes fitting all that engineering on a smaller truck is actually more costly, about $70,000 more costly, uh, in order to get at our all of the placement of our fairly intricate wet well system. So that's the explanation. Okay, uh, very good. So, any other comments on consent? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Walker. Yes. Hi, Jim Walker, owner of the bungalow, and I also uh, sit on the uh, CDM bid. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council, for considering our application for outside dining. I'd just <coughs> like to respond to Mr. Mosier's comment. First of all, Mr. Mosier has attended just about every bid meeting that I've been involved in. There's no selfish interest on my part. I sit on the bid, I've been on this bid for 16 years since its inception, and have voted on a number of things in the, in the village of Corona Del Mar, including uh, improvements in sidewalks, um, uh, street lights, and whatever, for the good of the village. Um, <clears throat> I frankly feel that Mr. Mosier's comments are a little bit misinformed in the fact that, um, again, he has set through several meetings, there has never been an issue in voting, and frankly, when the <clears throat> vision of this project began, there was never a guarantee that outside dining would be part of the vision. That didn't deter me from voting for the improvement on the sidewalk, and that's why we're here today. If it had been improved, or in, I'm sorry, if it had been guaranteed, we wouldn't be here. 
So I think each of us, myself, uh, El Ranchito, and Rothschilds are here and asking your permission and your confidence that this is going to add a great energy, a great diversity, as the lady just stated, to the village of Corona del Mar, and that's the point of it. I can tell you, since that sidewalk has gone in, we haven't seen a lot of tourists there. We haven't seen a huge increase in the amount of people walking up and down the sidewalk. And I feel that bringing the restaurants and the outside dining is the very energy that's going to be uh, the catalyst to uh, that endeavor. And so I would hope that you would consider that um, uh, it's a great project, it's a great opportunity, and I look forward to um, um, looking at it in, uh, in that way. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so on any other public comments on the consent calendar? Seeing none, so we should vote on the motion to... Uh, you got two requests to no, I'm, I'm, uh, Oh, I apologize. Is there, I don't have a request. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the city attorney reminded me I need to recuse myself on item 21 because my house is within the, was it 500 feet? And uh, so could you make that part of your motion, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon? Yes, I'll amend it as such. Thank it's you. okay with the second. Okay. And then just briefly, I had a recommendation. Uh, on item number four, I wasn't sure if you were just pulling part of it or if you're pulling the whole item. My recommendation would be to pull the whole item. And then from what I heard uh, you say, if, if that's the direction of the council, then you would just make a motion for A, one through three, and not four, four six, and seven or B, but also C. So it'd be four, A, one, two, three, and C to accomplish what you want. But I'd pull the whole item so it's considered together as opposed to just pulling part of it. All right, just a second. I just want to be sure though that um, the item that would continue to go to the, it's, it, it's expected at some point it will go to a county ballot. So I don't want to remove that opportunity. So, no, that wouldn't remove the opportunity. Right. It, it, just for tonight, you'd be considering it all, all together. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, I accept that. All right, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon, we have a second, so we'll call for the vote. Yes. Wait, I'm sorry. Did we pull all of item four or just four, six, and seven and B? We're pulling all, all items of number four. The whole, the yes. whole number four. Okay, thank you. So let's vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Okay, now we will bring items 4 and 32 from current business forward. Do you want to make a motion? And, well, and Keith Curry, uh, Councilmember Curry had raised an issue about whether it would be appropriate okay. to consider those items together. The Council Policy A6 allows for the Mayor to basically reorganize the agenda so it would be appropriate to consider those items together. Thank you. Somebody off script, are you gonna make your motion? Hey, just one <laughs> moment. Of course, Scorsese, thank you, Director. Um, yes, um, I have a couple comments on this item. I tend to agree with uh, Mayor Dixon on this issue. Um, I believe that uh, Councilman Curry is going along the right path to change it from four votes required to put a tax increase on the ballot to five votes is a good start. And I would like to explore how to make it stronger, and also I would like it to combine it with uh, Scott Piotr's uh, suggestion because I believe that uh, spending and debt goes hand in hand with taxation. So I hope we can come to a resolution. I'm going to name this the Curry Piotr Tax Protection Plan. <laughs> we can some sort of compromise, and uh, I am going to. Um, I will move to have. Um, this is going to get tricky, Mr. Harp. So please help me. So okay. Four subsection. Four, six, and seven joined with item 32 to be set with the finance committee with direction to compile the compromise essentially uh, involving both of them for one initiative. Yeah, I, I think that's great. That's the first, that would be the first part. And then it would also be to move for A1, 2, and 3 for adoption as well as C and, and take no action on B at this time. So is your recommendation to do it all in one motion? That would be my recommendation, but you can do it separately if you prefer. Uh, if Yes. We'll okay. just say that it was done that way. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? I'll second it. Any discussion? Mr. Curry. 
Well, I'm a little surprised, Mayor, to hear that you uh, didn't think that this got public discussion because it was before the council a year ago, May 26, according to the staff report that's in your book, for discussion. And the city council here heard this item at least twice, probably three times if my memory is correct. All of you, including you, Mayor, supported it without any objection and have had an entire year now uh, to raise these issues that you now raise uh, trying to hijack it and combine it with Mr. Piotr's measure, which is completely incompatible. Uh, I, I, there's a name for the kind of child that would be produced from that, Mr. Muldoon, but I won't use it uh, in tonight's debate. Uh, we uh, did this in conjunction with the city of Anaheim because it's something they were doing at the same time. We did it uh, at the request of and with the support of the Orange County Taxpayers Association, who in the fall uh, nominated us for an award for doing this. So to now try to undo it, where there's no real opposition to this, there's no real question about its value, it simply is a, is a political ploy to combine it with a very poorly drafted, poorly conceived uh, proposal from Mr. Piotr, and to sort of hijack this idea and, and everybody sort of pretend that the history that happened over the course of last year putting this on the ballot didn't occur. Now I can speak at length about Mr. Piotr's uh, motion, uh, proposal, uh, first of all, it's issues that should, if they, if they were done at all, should be in a debt policy, not in the city charter. It's poorly worded. We're already in, uh, exceeding the debt cap that is proposed here, so all debt, including things such as police car uh, leases and office building leases and copy machine leases, uh, would need to go to the voters. It would pit neighbor against neighbor, because consider this. The, we don't have any debt proposed in the city coming up because we cleared the decks of it in the last city council. But one thing that could require debt is handling the seawall issue. Now, if you live on Balboa Island on the peninsula, you should think hard about whether or not you want to have the public improvements necessary to protect your neighborhood put to a public vote by people living miles away who have no stake in the issue. You know, typically what happens in communities is that they Christmas tree those measures so everybody gets something, they end up having more uh, debt than they would have had uh, otherwise. The call provisions are completely contrary to what is uh, uh, established practice in public finance. Ten-year call provisions are, are the established norm. It will, cost our, it will make our debt cost more. Public-private partnerships which use taxable debt may be precluded entirely from the city. Pension obligation bonds, which the mayor and Mr. O'Neill cited in their, in their uh, op-ed recently, uh, it's not an idea that I think is a good idea or has it's, it's lost some of its cachet, but those are taxable bonds. It could very well be precluded as an option through the adoption of this. Uh, revenue bonds for water and sewer would have an entirely different debt calculation, and uh, we would be, uh, could be unable to make the improvements necessary to fix our 110-year-old uh, water system. And here's the thing. If this were a good idea, it would be done in some other jurisdiction and we could copy it. The proposal I had is, is current law in Huntington Beach. It's, current, it's law in Anaheim, or it will be law in Anaheim when they vote on it. So that's an idea that we've taken from other people because it's a good idea to have a supermajority to put something on the ballot that increases taxes. But this idea, this proposal, exists nowhere else in North America. If people vote for that, out of 55,000 local city council people, the only four people who would have voted for this provision would be sitting on this dais. It is an utterly and completely irresponsible proposal. I don't want it linked with mine. That's probably why they try to put them together here. This is just amateur hour politics that's going on up here. So let's vote to put on what we did a, a year ago and put it on the ballot. Stop your retribution in terms of your political tactics. <laughs> Take this uh, measure that shouldn't be here, which, by the way, was proposed last top week, we referred to the Finance Committee, and then it came up for adoption, uh, bypassing that entire process. So people just make stuff up here as they go along, and they're putting a bunch of stuff in the city charter that will have long-term ramifications uh, for the financial well-being of the city. Normally, when you mess up and do a mistake up here, it's a, it's a small mistake. This is a mistake that will have long-term ramifications. Ask the staff if they support this, and they'll tell you no, because it's not good government policy. It's not recommended policy in any jurisdiction by the government finance officers, by the rating agencies, by the investment banks and financial advisors, by anybody. This is an idea born from the mind of Piotr that is negative and bad for our city. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. Thank you. Councilman Curry, I'm happy to remove your name. I thought you'd want it on it just for fun. But, um, you know, I worked in the White House for President George W. Bush, and um, what I saw was a common theme, which is let's, let's cut taxes, let's, let's cut rates, which I agree with. 
but let's spend like drunken sailors. And uh, I don't believe in that. We are one of the richest cities in the United States. We can be in a leader in deciding whether or not debt should be uh, incurred and let the voters decide. I'm I'm actually really um, deferential to Councilman um, Curry's wisdom on uh, the dangers of it, which is why it would be vetted. And uh, we would have a cap on how much so that it would not threaten um, any of the operations. But I, from what I understand, it's a very generous proposal that Piotr has, uh, Councilman Piotr has. It still lets us do business as usual, but would require a public vote on some issues that um, many voters would probably think is sort of egregious spending. So that's why I support this. Um, I still support uh, your resolution, Councilman Curry, going forward at some point. But rather than spend uh, the tens of thousands of dollars, which is not a lot, actually, to do it once and then maybe do it again, I assume do it right and get both ends of the equation, the debt and the taxation, together. Uh, Mr. Piotr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You know, part, part of what I submitted in the, in the fiscal reform charter amendment was, unlike Mr. Curry, I have no problem allowing the voters to decide. I think the voters are... Uh, well-educated in this community and, and should have a voice. Uh, what this does is, you know, putting it back into, let's say, the example of the, our city hall, which I refer to as the Tajma City Hall. What this meant would be that it would have gone before the voters and the voters would have had a say in the scope of this project when the previous council came to borrow $128 million, which is almost three quarters of our general fund, annual general fund. Just think, Mr. Curry, he ran for assembly in 2014, and we borrowed this money in 2010. Mr. Curry credits his defeat for assembly because we clobbered him on the Tajma City Hall. Mr. Curry, if I, I, I put this forth to you that if this initiative, this charter amendment had been in place, we might be calling you Assemblyman Curry. This would have stopped more than likely the, the utter waste of money on our city hall. It's not going to bring back that money, but it's going to insert the voters into the process, and that's all I'm asking for. And I, and I, I trust the voters. I have no problem erring on the side of voters, and it is in the spirit of Prop 13 which is what Mr. Curry is trying to protect with his charter amendment. So I'm a little disconcerted over the fact that he isn't interested in having the voters say some things when, when he is, when it comes to new taxes, but when it comes to new debt, new borrowing, even though he goes through, he, meaning the previous council, has went through a lot of gyrations to be able to borrow money without having to go to a vote of the people, the $128 million, uh, in this convoluted scheme called certificates of participation, which are widely used in the state. I don't doubt, I don't dispute that, but it's not right. It's not right that you do the end run around the voters, and right now, as proposed, my fiscal accountability would allow 25% or less of the general fund, so you can borrow $50 million if we didn't have any other debt without going to the voters. That pays for seawalls. That pays for extraordinary expenses that might come up. But when it comes to things like seawalls, we know that we can, we can give life to those seawalls another 20 years. What do we do in these 20 years? We save money knowing we've got a major expense in 20 years. We probably don't even have to borrow money if we save our money ahead of time. This will force us to be more fiscally disciplined and keep councils like the last council from being fiscally irresponsible. And I'm okay with the, with the finance committee vetting and working out the details of the language. Let the bond council have at it. But the intent is let's insert the voters in the middle of that decision-making process when it exceeds a quarter of our general plan fund, and or in this case, around $50 million. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Curry. Well, because we already have $120 million of debt, that means that next time we lease a police car, it's going to have to go to the voters to be voted on. That's why this is such a poorly worded proposal. COPs don't require taxes. General obligation bonds increase taxes, which is why they require a vote of the people. COPs do not. This is going to pit neighborhood versus neighborhood. Mr. Piotr has said apparently we don't have to spend money on seawalls for 20 years. I don't think that's true. 
uh, and that we can somehow save them. What this is designed to do, along with the linkage to his Ill unworkable uh, call provision that requires us to have callable debt in five years, which nobody else in America does. That's not a convention for the bond market. We are going to end up, it's, this is a design for chaos. It's designed to leave a big turd in the city after he leaves where we can't build anything. Because as you heard him, he doesn't want to build anything. He thinks parks are where homeless people sleep. We don't need any more. So if he can keep the city from having the capacity to do anything, he will have accomplished his job. This is pathetic. This is bad public policy. It's contrary to the interests of our residents and our citizens. And, it is to, and nobody else in America has this policy. That's the thing about it. He is foisting this on us through his own ignorance of the financial markets. It's an absolute disgrace. Okay, seeing no other comments, let me just uh, clarify, uh, Mr. Curry, this is the reason why it's this matter, both these matters, and particularly the bond measure, is going to the Finance Committee is specifically to work out the details and to see if it is a viable, this, this is my belief, to see if it is a viable proposal. I'm concerned that just to put it out to the vote would have been premature and it needs to be fleshed out and we need to have bond counsel, financial advisor, investment bankers, we need to have financial expertise to guide us through this process at the finance committee level where you will be and can participate in these discussions. Uh, and I, I just think that's the right thing to do. So by going through all those points now, I don't know where this is going to end up, but let's vet it through the Finance Committee and see where we end up. So seeing no other comments here, we'll... Yes. Well, I don't know why they can't. They're both going to the finance. The recommendation is that they both go to the Finance Committee. I mean, that's the motion. So that's... Their Second. All right. Uh, let's take a vote on. Well, we Man, can we have public first. input first? Oh. Yes. <laughs> we need to go to the public. Any comments from members of the public? Please come forward. Mayor Dixon, members of the council, my name is Jim Moser. Uh, Mayor Dixon, I agree with you that when last year the first charter amendment proposal was proposed or, or voted on by the council, I, I did not see any particular urgency about it. I don't think we're about to be putting tax measures on the ballot, and I, I don't know that that is urgent. <coughs> I agree with you on that. And echoing what Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon said, I want to remind the council there is a cost to putting measures on the ballot, and I want to remind the council that in 2010 we had a charter amendment backed by Councilman Curry that put 15 issues in a single vote on the ballot called Measure V. In 2012, we had a measure that put 38 different charter amendments into one vote on the, on the ballot called Measure uh, EE. In both cases, we were told that we couldn't separate out issues because it was so expensive to put them on the ballot. So I, I want to keep you, they have you keep that in mind. However, I also would point out, speaking of election expenses, the resolution that you all adopted a year ago, which is here on page 419, it's attachment D, says that we are holding an election on November 8th, 2016, to vote on this measure. I didn't agree with that at the time, but that's what you voted on. Uh, if you decide to, to get vote against number four, which is to not consolidate that with the county election, I think that means the city is obligated to hold the election on that at their own expense and prepare the ballots themselves and so forth. Uh, that would seem to me extremely expensive. So if, if you have said you're going to put it on the ballot, you're going to have to change your decision about that or do something other than I'm hearing here tonight. I don't think it's as simple as just voting not to consolidate it. You already have declared that you're going to hold an election on it. And then again, speaking of expenses, I raised a question in writing about it, which I think is item number three on what you're going to vote on, Resolution 2016-69 about the requirement to send out translated ballots and so forth, page 
4-13 appears to say that you're telling the county you want them to send statements in Spanish and English to all voters, and then separately a ballot to those in Spanish and Chinese who request them. I, I find it odd that we're sending those to everybody, and I asked if that's a typo. I still don't know. I would hope we're sending ballots to everybody in English, in the English language, and only to those who request them in Spanish and Chinese, but you're ordering something different here. It sounds expensive to me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Um, is that a public comment? Okay. Hi, I'm Sam Wertheimer from Newport Harbor. I don't know if you need that, but... Um, I am here, and I'm actually very curious about what you guys are talking about, and I am pretty ignorant on what you're talking about, so I'd really like you to explain in like simple terms what agenda item number four, what 32 is, why you're putting them together, why you want to separate them, just like, what is going on here? <laughs> All right, we, we will do that. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me ask the city attorney just to comment, uh, or the city clerk, on the items that Mr. Mosher was bringing up. So, so just briefly, if if the council goes forward with the original motion, then we will need to bring back a new resolution to, at some point, if it's not going to go forward, we should basically bring back a resolution uh, revoking resolution number 2015-44, the original action. Um, but that's something that we could decide a, at a future date, depending on how, how things go here this evening. And then, did the motion raise another issue? About the language. Oh, the, so it goes out in English, and um, to the extent there's any ambiguity, the resolution will fix that. That's just, um, it only goes out in English, it goes out in the other languages if people request it. And then also, we do have candidate elections, district council elections, so th there will be a reason for a city ballot in November, correct? That, that's right. That's yeah. and, and Mr. Harp, we also can change it for, if we can't make 2016, just change it to go 2018, correct? You said we can strike it, we also could amend it? That's right. That's Thank correct. You. Um, and let me just make a comment for the young gentleman who just spoke. Um, do you have a copy of our blue agenda that was at? Okay. So these items are there and under uh, on the consent calendar, item number four, and then on the current business in the back of the agenda is item number thirty-two. And those are the items we are consolidating this discussion that you're hearing if somewhere out there. Okay? <laughs> it's like that cartoon, this is a bill, and then the bill goes down the steps of Capitol. There you go. It's like that. All right. So we have a motion and a sec. Can I just ask? Oh, excuse me. So All it right. would seem to me, Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Uh, Moshe makes a good point. We need to, we, we've already adopted and sent to the ballot what I had proposed a year ago in the resolution that we adopted in 2015. So that's not agendized for any kind of repeal tonight. That, that's right. It's not agendized for that end. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon was correct. It could be amended to be basically change it to 2018 instead of 2016, or it could be rescinded at yeah. a future date. But that's a that's a action that will need to be taken down the road because it's not on the agenda tonight. But it doesn't mean that the that what's been proposed can't happen as far as okay. not going forward with. Um, Items four, five, and six, referring those to the finance well, committee. I would offer my editorial comment to the young man in the back that what's happening here is a political hijacking and taking a good idea and trying to combat it with a bad idea, and you know what happens when you do that. I, I think we do need a little bit of clarity, though, on what the substitute motion is. The um, substitute motion is to vote on them separately. That, well, they've already been combined. That's a, just a procedural issue. It seems like you need to make a substantive motion if you're going to make a substitute motion. Um, Mr. Tello, do you want to make a comment? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is just a little bit too cute for me. We've, we've got three issues that we're talking about here. One is, which we probably all agree on, and that's the routine motions to set the, um, set the election for the fall. And the second item is the charter amendment that we approved last year, whether that's on the ballot or not. And then item 32, which is a totally new thing. And this whole thing of combining them is just... Uh, a way to force people that 
may have objections to one or two of those items to have to vote against the routine stuff of um, putting these items on the uh, on the ballot uh, for the election in the fall. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in support of uh, splitting these off and we can deal with item number four. And if we're going to do the charter amendment that we adopted last year, include it as part of four or cut it out of four and then go on to 32 and discuss 32 separately, that way we can all weigh in exactly how we feel on each of those three issues. Well, he, Mr. Salch has a good point. We want to preserve the requirements that we have to do to consolidate the election, correct? Yeah, so I, I was, I'm a little confused about what exactly is being separated. I, what I'm hearing is you want to separate the 4A, 1 through 3, and C from the rest of it. Okay, and I'm hearing something different from Councilmember Sellage, who's saying he'd like to vote on 4A, 1 through 3, and then the items 4, 6, and 7 separately. That's no, what I'm hearing from you. No, no, I'm saying the same as Councilmember Curry. I think when we discuss item 4, if we make some changes regarding the Charter Amendment, we can do that as part of that discussion. Okay, so the substitute motion is to separate 4 from 32, and the original motion is still the original motion. So you're in a, posi you're okay. a position to vote. Let's call the vote. Yes, this vote is for the substitute motion to discuss them separately, items 4 and 32. With Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon, Mayor Dixon, Council Members Duffield and Piotr voting no, the motion, the motion fails. And now the original motion, and does anyone need it repeated? I do, I do actually. Um, the original motion, just to clarify that it is to send both of, uh, both item four, although I think with the exception of the, the uh, sections that call the agenda for November 8th, and item 2032 to the Finance Committee for a review and a report back. And I guess I, I'm, I'm still a little concerned about the timing. I know I, I don't think the Finance Committee has many meetings over the summer in part because of vacations, and I, I need to get clarity from the Council on whether or not there's an expectation that these would both meet the November ballot if they were sent to the Finance Committee. It, it's possible, but that's not in the motion. That's not, so what is in the motion? It's no, no specific date. No, but I mean, if Finance Committee puts it together, they're set to meet and and I intend to okay. agendize these items at the Thursday, June 16th meeting, which is this week. Uh, but we are on hiatus for the summer, so we'll look at it. And we, and we have to go through a process to get okay. an outside as, as as I, I am now clear. Thank you. Okay. Well, the agenda for the Finance Committee under the Brown Act is already published because the meeting's on Thursday, so we're within the limit. I don't know that this can be agendized. No, no, no. I would propose that it be agent for a future meeting. Well, there's no future meeting. Until right, September. Madam Mayor, also part of the motion is an affirmative yes on the first three yeah. aspects of, of number four, right? Can, can I just, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So what I'm hearing is your, the motion was 4A1, 2, and 3, and C, and then to take no action on B and to refer items 4A, 4, 6, and 7, as well as item 32 to the Finance Committee. Correct. Correct. I just hope the oh. public appreciates the degree of gymnastics we're going through for the political nonsense of this whole measure. Thank you for your This commentary. is the right thing to do for uh, a public. This is for the residents so they fully understand why we are doing this, what's right to do for the, for the people. No. Call the question. It does not need to be politicized for any election. There's no rush to do this. No. You're out of order, aren't you? No. Uh, let's call for the vote. Oh, Mr. Seller, did you have another comment you wanted to make? I apologize. Oh, Mr. Kiff had the same question I did, so it's been answered. Okay, thank you. Let's call for the vote. With council members Curry, Petros, and Selich voting no, the motion carries 4-3. Okay, now item number eight on the consent calendar that was pulled. Was that Mr. Piotr? Yes. 
Madam Mayor, this, the, we went over this in study session. This is, for those that weren't here, this is where we have to pony up $308,000 or somewhere in that category, give it to the Department of Healthcare Services, where they use federal matching grants, grants through Obamacare, and then maybe give us our 308000 back along with another $102,000. Uh, and I just, I, I'm going to vote against this. I think that even though it's been applied through many of the hospitals and things in the area, just too much like a pyramid scheme, too much like a bureaucratic nightmare, and I'm just not going to support it. So that's why I pulled it. Mr. Selich. That's not oh, all right. Is Mr. Petros, did you want to speak? Point of clarification, Mr. Piotr constantly refers to this as Obamacare. Didn't we hear in the study session that this has been ongoing prior to ACA? Um, I, I heard Angela say from 2011, but um, Mr. Piotr's understanding is similar to my own. I, I wouldn't refer to it that way, but there was a provision in the Affordable Care Act that expanded Medicare eligibility and Medicare funds to the state should they choose to provide additional coverage. Is my understanding that this is a portion of those funds? Um, Mr. Curry. Well, as we heard in study session, this is going to net us an additional hundred to three hundred thousand dollars annually in terms of reimbursements for the city. His opposition to this is, once again, financially completely irresponsible that someone would approach the general fund like this because he's trying to make a political point against the president. This is something that competent jurisdictions in terms of managing their health care are doing across the country, including here in Orange County. And again, it costs the city money to follow Piotr's advice. So I'll be, I will move the item for approval. Second. Okay, let's have some public comments. On this item, number eight, the Medi-Cal Managed Care Rate Range Intergovernmental Transfer Program. Any public comments? Please come forward. Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. For what little it's worth, I just want to say I uh, support the staff's recommendation that this is a safe thing to do and a good thing for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Please come forward. All right, I'll bring it back to the council. Any, Mr. Muldoon, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. Yeah, I just want to state my own opinion on this since we're all sharing our opinions. Um, I view this as the worst of the worst of bureaucracy because of how we have to get our own money. But at the end of the day, Orange County, and specifically Newport Beach, writes many more checks than we receive from the federal government. And this is an opportunity for us to get some of our own tax dollars back to our community. So I, I no way, shape, or form, I'm... Uh, trying to make a controversial statement about how I feel about the condition of our health system, but I believe that Newport um, would, be, would benefit from participating and receiving our own tax dollars back. All right, let's call for the vote. With Council Member Piotr voting no, the motion carries 6-1. All right, item number 20, Mr. Piotr, I believe you pulled that, a Newport Beach sustainability plan. Yeah, we had the sustainability plan presented to us at our last council meeting, and I like a lot of the things that are in there. A lot of the things that are in there are things that we're already doing as required by other regulations, uh, such as the Green Building Code. And there are a lot of financial incentives for uh, applicants and for people to um, go ahead and and conserve and save, as uh, Nancy Gardner's pointed out. Um, my fear in approving this is that we just perpetuate a bureaucracy or a potential bureaucracy. So uh, I would like to just vote no on this. Okay, any other comments? Move the item. Second. All right, any public comments? I, w I would just say that one of the, the, the points of the... Could you please identify? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nancy Gardner. Uh, one of the points of, of the plan is to become more flexible so that government doesn't stand in the way of, uh, of people trying to do things. I met an architect, and he said, you know, what are you doing lately? And I said, well, we're working on the sustainability plan. He said, that's great because one of the things we're trying to do is build more sustainable commercial buildings because we get higher rents for them. And one of our biggest problems is 
uh, government regulations that tie us up. So in a sense, a sustainability plan can also be a way of freeing uh, applicants and things from government restraints. So I hope that you will support the idea. And I'm really excited about having the committees and commissions look at it because they're your people that you've selected to advise you, and I think their input will be invaluable. Thank you. I actually concur with that statement that we'll have all the functional committees look at this and, and really identify what would work and what is needed in the community. All right, seeing no further comments, call for the vote. With Council Member Piotr and Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon voting no, the motion carries 5-2. All right, and do we need to vote on item number 21 because Mr. Duffield has to recuse himself? It was Council Member Selich. I believe that was Selich. included in the original, the oh, original the motion. motion. Correct. Oh, okay. All right, so we will move on. Oh, I have one other comment to make on item number nine, just a comment, and I'm not pulling it. I meant to say this earlier, regarding Marina Park, and I just want to compliment staff for a project that is a beautiful project in addition to District 1 on Balboa Peninsula. And it came in significantly under budget by about $3 million. And I'm pleased to note that the final accounting on a major capital project will show that the expenditures were about $3 million less than originally budgeted. The change orders were quite low at 4.45%. I believe this was a project well delivered by Public Works and our contractors, especially KPRS Construction and our project manager, Griffin Holdings. I also want to mention how well it is being received in my district now that it has been handed over to Recreation Services and Harbor Resources for Management for the uh, boat docking and, and the sailing program. The park is absolutely incredible. I drive by it constantly, and it is a well used and inviting and appreciated facility. Actually, I've said this, I think I'm correct in saying it's the first public investment of this magnitude in District 1 and since the original City Hall, well, the City Hall that's currently being demolished was built about 60 years ago. So I appreciate staff's good work on this. So my congratulations to the overall team who designed, built, and are now managing Marina Park. District 1 is proud to be its home. All right, moving. Mayor, before, sure. just uh, you reminded me, I wanted to make one final comment. I didn't want to pull item 22, but the nominees for the Planning Commission, I think, uh, uh, did not reflect one of the incumbent members who'd served, uh, uh, I think, very well on the committee for more than uh, four years. It also didn't reflect uh, our former and longtime chairman of uh, EQUAC, uh, uh, Debbie Stevens, who uh, I think is certainly deserving of being put before uh, the, the council for consideration, and Tim Stokes. Some of the new council members may not be aware of their long-term involvement with the city. So when we vote on this next week, I'm going to be uh, nominating them for consideration as well. Okay. I think this list properly reflects some political retribution, which seems to be the watchword <laughs> of the day. I don't... I, I, I kind of reject that statement. We <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. Not only is that comment out of, or, out of order and below the belt, but it's factually not true. Yeah, it's, it's kind of insulting, actually. One of my opponents is a great guy named Roy Engelbrecht, and I support him for reappointment to the Parks and Recs Commission because I want to work with someone. I don't care if someone was someone I ran against. Tim Brown is one of the nicest men you'll meet. He's missed almost a quarter of the meetings. So it's a very tough decision, but it's the right thing to do for Planning Commission because it's a very important meeting. Now, when you make a comment like that, I have to defend myself and say something I'd rather not say about someone else. So yeah, I don't appreciate it, and you know, I wish that there'd be less of this. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Piotr. Quick question, City Attorney. If they're not, if somebody's not on this list that we just approved, are they eligible to be considered next meeting? Do we have to vote to agendize that? Because we had a process, a nominating committee of Mr. Petros, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon, and myself. I would remind everybody for, of the Engelbrecht example where that's exactly what happened. Which was what? Well, what's been done in the past is if someone wanted to be added at a future date, you're, confer you're confirming the nominees here. What we've done in the past is that if somebody wanted to be added in the future and you wanted to waive council policy, the council policy related there too, then we have permitted that in the past. But you have to waive the council policy in order to do it. So we have to take action to do that now? 
or we would do that next time? Well, really the proper way, I think the way that the original policy was written and what it's intended is that if people want to be added to this list, then what should happen is, since we've already voted on it, it should be reconsidered, the time should be reconsidered, and the people's names should be added to this list. And then, then it comes forward with everybody there so that the public knows who, who's up for consideration as opposed to who adding it at the meeting. But there's no legal reason why you couldn't add someone at the meeting if you wanted to waive the council policy. Well, when would we waive the council policy now or in the 28th? You would waive it on the 28th. Okay. All right. All right, uh, Madam Clerk. Public comments on non-agenda items. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Do we have any oral reports from City Council members on committee activities? Mr. Petros. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. I apologize. My apologies, Mr. Mosher. <laughs> Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosher. I think we're on public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, I expected tonight to be mostly budget night, so I had a non-agenda item related to the budget, which will be, the approval of which will be your next item. Next agenda item. Uh, the, the, what I wanted to say is the budget is a spending plan and prudent management requires not just planning what you're going to spend, but tracking and reflecting upon what you actually spend. What I wanted to say about that is last night I think I was the only resident from Newport Beach who attended the Orange County Auditor Controller's first seminar training session trying to educate the public about reading governmental financial statements. And one statement our Orange County Auditor Controller made that struck me was that in the next week or two, he plans for Orange County, which has a budget of about $6 billion, B billion, to be putting the county checkbook online so that the residents of Orange County can see the city's expenses, the county's expenses, as they happen. And I have to wonder, as I've wondered before, why Newport Beach, which is much smaller budget, much smaller number of checks, can't make those expenditures equally transparent and visible to the residents of Newport Beach. Second comment I wanted to make about tracking expenses that have happened in the past was to wonder what's happening about the Civic Center audit. It was a year ago, June 16th, that you authorized an audit of the spending on this Civic Center. January 24th, you approved, which I thought was not a particularly wise thing to do, spending $100,000 contract with a Miss Gibson to complete a phase one that was supposed to be completed by February 29th. In March, we heard a report that Ms. Gibson had run into some roadblocks. She wasn't getting all the documents she wanted, but those documents we heard had started to become forthcoming after Ms. Count Mer Pro Tem Muldoon made an inquiry about that starting on February 23rd. Now it's four months later and we still haven't heard anything about what's going on with this audit of how money was spent on the Civic Center. So I, I, for one, am wondering what's happening with that. Thank you. Just briefly, so, so everyone will know, uh, we're looking at to bring that back uh, the first meeting in July, the Civic Center audit. Um, so that's kind of the current timeline. I spoke to the auditor today, and it looks like that date works, but um, if for some reason it changed, I'll update, I'll update the council and the public. Okay, very good. All right, any other public comments on non-agenda items? Please come forward. Good evening. I'm Phil Milner with Newport Citizens for Responsible Growth. Our group represents several resident homeowner associations around Corona de Mar High School. And we're in favor of quality and safe facilities for Corona de Mar High School students. Our charter is to mitigate the undesirable consequences of the athletic field modifications, including noise, lighting, parking, traffic, safety, trash, and other issues. These issues all affect our quality of life and our ability to have peaceful enjoyment of our homes. 
The potential of a stadium in this tight neighborhood location has already reduced property values in the area, which is another issue you should be aware of. And unfortunately, I have firsthand knowledge of this. We realize the city council has no direct re say regarding the facility, but the city has supported our group by including city representatives in the working group studying the various elements of the project. The school board wants this group to help formulate a facilities usage agreement once the project is completed. One of our group addressed you last council meeting regarding our alternative plan. We provided the plan to the Newport Mesa Unified School District and their CEQA consultant to be included in the EAR for evaluation. I've made copies of the elements of that plan and handed them to you tonight so you could better understand our plan and its benefits. If you go to the second page of our, my handout and also pull out the photograph that's attached to the back, you'll see where the current uh, football field and track are in the upper right-hand corner. And our proposal on the alternative is to replace that football field, which is natural grass now, and the track that's there with a new, new track and field. But we also uh, wanna move and make another synthetic field in the area that's outlined in the left center area, which is now, if you look closely, you can see that there's a football field line basically in that area. We believe that there's enough room to put a second synthetic field there with uh, portable lights would be preferable for us that can be taken down outside of season so that they're, they're not in the area. There are a variety of benefits here which would include not having 80 foot tall light poles, uh, less noise, uh, you're not gonna have more permanent seating in the main uh, area where the existing football field is. The white roof building you see between the two fields on the photograph is actually the bathroom facility that would be able to be accessed from both fields. Uh, parking can come from the uh, lower right-hand area for the field on the right, and there's also a second back lot in the lower left that would access the other field, so it alleviates some of the parking problems. We also create better aesthetics by maintaining those trees that you see just above the outline of the track on the upper right-hand corner. They'd stay there and give a better-looking presentation. And this way, we don't have a sound wall and a PA system, things of like that to, uh, to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just briefly, we did we did submit comments uh, when they were looking at the scoping for the environmental document. It is a project that the city is monitoring. Thank you. Please come forward. Jerry Shear. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Could you please repeat your name? Jerry Shear. S C H E R R. I'm talking. Uh, kind of follow up with uh, what Phil Milner was talking about. Um, this is on the topic of traffic and pedestrian issues related to Corona del Mar High School, middle school. This is a quote from an article, June 19, 1998. Boy 12 is hit by car near school. Before school began Thursday, which was the last day of school, a 12-year-old seventh grader was struck by a car and injured. Counselors stood by to help upset, and uh, students were upset by the incident horrible way to end a year. I actually was teaching at the school at that time and I remember personally. Um, May 12th, 2016, I'm quoting from a memo that Kathy Scott, the principal of CDM High School, sent to parents. The CDM office has been receiving calls the last few days regarding concerns over students crossing East Bluff Drive from Alba Street intersection. Apparently students are coming out of the East Bluff neighborhood instead of walking down to the crossing guard or crossing at the intersection. There have also been reports of students dashing between cars that are waiting to turn into the parking lot. There is no crosswalk, no protection at all for pedestrians at that point. These are extremely dangerous actions. We have students hit we have had students hit on East Bluff in the past. I urge you, responsible future traffic plans must address the dangerous half-answered traffic patterns noted by, in this uh, memo, the CDM principal, and we that live in the East Bluff neighborhood, we see it on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Next comment, please. Okay there. Good evening, Mayor Dixon, members of the City Council and City staff. 
My name is Mara Quist, and I live in the East Bluff neighborhood across the street from Condemar High School. I've brought a functional drawing of the area, if not an artistic one. And Aurelia Street is in green because it's a Zone 3 permit parking district, which means there's unlimited one-hour parking on school days, 7 a.m. through 4 p.m., unless you're a resident and you have a permit, and then you can stay on the street longer. This was established in 2013 due to excessive high school parking on Aurelia Street. Thank you very much, Mr. Harp. <laughs> I am here tonight on behalf of 83 households in the East Bluff neighborhood to respectfully ask that Zone 3, which right now is Aurelia Street only in green, be expanded to also include the blue streets, Aleppo, Arbutus, Alder Place, Almond Place, and the span of Alta Vista Drive between Aleppo and Aurelia. We also respectfully request that the hours of the parking restrictions be expanded from the current 7 a.m. through 4 p.m. to 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. A team of residents from these five streets has collected signatures that show that the majority of residents in their proposed Zone 3 expansion area desire preferential parking privileges. This satisfies criteria D of Chapter 12.68.30 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code. Specifically, of the 83 households on the five blue streets in question, 82% support Zone 3 status with expanded hours, 1% oppose it, and 17% of households could not be reached after multiple attempts. Reasons cited by residents for their support of the parking restrictions included student drivers speeding on residential streets, more students parking in the neighborhood means more students jaywalking at East Bluff Drive and Alba, Student vehicles lining corners block views of oncoming traffic when turning. Student vehicles impair access to driveways and visibility when backing out of them. Litter and trash left behind. No nearby parking spaces for family, friends, or vendors. Prevents street sweeping, diminution of property values. And dozens of empty spaces are observed daily in each of the high school's two student parking lots, while our residential streets are crowded with parked vehicles from outside the neighborhood. We further believe that the other six criteria of chapter 12.68.30 are met. We understand that the city public works department will verify that these criteria are met and will then prepare a city council staff report with recommendations on how to proceed. On behalf of 82% of the total households on these blue streets or restated 99% of the contacted households Please begin the process to expand Zone 3 to include Aleppo, Arbutus, Alder, Almond, and the southernmost span of Alta Vista. And please extend the hours to 7 a.m. through 10 p.m. Thank you all for your continued assistance with this matter. And Mr. Webb, I will provide you and Mr. Bryan with a file of these signatures and the results by the end of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Councilman, Bernie Savalstad, President of Newport Beach Historical Society. My understanding is from Tara Finnegan that uh, the request for funds would not be on the agenda tonight budget, so that's why I'm speaking. She mentioned that the appropriate place would be on the community uh, grant program. So I just want to mention if that's true, which it probably is, that uh, you would take this under deep consideration at that time. And um, I found out in 206, when I did the McFadden Square historical uh, area, that there's really nobody in Newport Beach except maybe Don Webb and a person that was deathly sick, Bill Grundy, and died later. Uh, knew anything about the history of Newport Beach generally, and nothing was being preserved, so I got involved uh, deeply in the last year or so, formed a 501c3 uh, with this group and got it regenera regenerated, board of directors. And we have 130 members or more and we have a new place, first time in 49 years history at the Balboa um, Library. So I'd like to have you consider our request uh, when this comes up, thank you. Thank you. Next public comment, please, non-agenda item. Please come forward.
Good evening, uh, Andrew Hernandez, and uh, my family and I uh, want to thank you for bringing back the fire pits. Uh, we've enjoyed them my, uh, for many years, and uh, they uh, should have never been briefly taken away, so uh, please keep them uh, and fight those of you that uh, fought for those. Also, uh, the Marina Park, I want to ditto. Uh, Phenomenal. We just, uh, my wife and I are school teachers, and we just sit there all day long and just dazed, and uh, it, it's a remarkable. So we appreciate the uh, the buildings and, and parks and everything you guys do. You do it top notch. And uh, <clears throat> Sunset Park, same thing. Uh, best park we've been in in a long time. Uh, and also, uh, we want to bring up we love biking. And we'd like to see the uh, boardwalk extended after the Balboa up here to uh, the jetty. Um, I know that's been uh, tossed back and forth between other other people unsuccessfully, but uh, that would be uh, great. We were just in Belmont Shores today. I, I went to Europe last year and, and other cities, and their boardwalks are also much wider. They have a walking and a biking uh, for safety. Um, I got pictures on my phone. Uh, they're a lot wider, actually. Uh, check out, you know, Huntington, especially in front of the pier where the, uh, it gets more dense with, uh, you know, the roller skating and jogging, and etc. Um, but anyways, the uh, extending the, the, the boardwalk uh, to the jetties, the news media is always there. People riding their bikes can continue on. I know there's uh, homes there with playgrounds taking over the beach, uh, pipes going over the walls, uh, you know, and they, they've... Uh, there's lawns and and while you're at the jetties you sit there and stare at those and 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 we read in the newspaper a few years ago that you're supposed to do something but there, it's still there but I would just you know I drove a tractor through college take it th take it right through there uh, you already own the the land uh, my deal too you can pull the cement and 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 uh, in a weekend and we can get a boardwalk all the way to the jetty and uh, the the whole state can come and, and enjoy that thing, make it wider, and I uh, think that would be a great accomplishment for you guys if you do that. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other public comments? I'm sorry. We have one. If you could do it in three minutes. <clears throat> no, we actually, we can't accept oh, you can't it okay. before because it... All right. Is this about the budget, too? That's actually the next item. But we can't do a PowerPoint unless you submit it 24 hours in advance. It's on our agenda. But I apologize that we didn't let you know that. But anyway, if it's a budget-related item, we'll have the public discussion. So that's the next item. It's in, it's in the next item. Yeah. All right. All right. Any other comments on non-agenda items? Going once, twice. All right. Oral reports, Mr. Petros. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, this Thursday at 4 p.m. in the Newport Coast uh, room, conference room, we will be holding a finance committee meeting. It is a full agenda. We will be taking up all of the items that we have not been looking at as we have been uh, doing the deep dive on this budget. Uh, I would encourage those in the public to attend as we will be going over um, items related to prioritizing some initiatives put together by a subcommittee of the Finance Committee and a number of other items uh, regarding uh, actuarial services and other consultant services. Uh, on a more upbeat note, uh, on the 22nd at 6.30 p.m., we'll be hosting the third public workshop on the West Newport Mesa streetscape uh, plan. This is a proposal to make the area west of Superior Avenue uh, have more opportunity for walkability, for bikeability, to make that part of town more of a neighborhood, to encourage uh, through good zoning, more open space, uh, and opportunities for neighborly behavior as that area uh, undergoes its transition uh, over on the west side. The meeting will be held at the Pacifica Christian School gym, our uh, west side gym that we share use with them. We don't have a west side center. It's at 881 West 15th Street, 
uh, over in the West Newport area. And I would encourage anybody who has an interest in the change on the west side to please come and provide your input. Thank you. Mr. Curry. No Mr. Sellers. No reports. Mr. Piotr. Mr. Duffield. I have none. Mayor Pro Tem. All right. We will now move into our public hearings. So the first item is the budget, uh, the fiscal year 2016-17 budget adoption and hearings uh, and recommendations from the Finance Committee and the budget checklist items. So uh, let me just kind of set the stage here for discussion of our budget, which uh, Council Member Petros, who's chair of the Finance Committee, will expand on in terms of the process. Uh, during this discussion, we will refer to a document called the checklist. It's attachment A on the staff report. So if you have a copy of that, uh, we'll be going through that. And it, I think it will be on the screen, too, won't it be? Think of the checklist as amendments to the proposed budget that was released earlier this spring. It is something, if something is on the checklist, it means a change, an addition, or a deletion to the proposed budget. So it's really the final reconciliation of pluses and minuses. Going forward from here, staff will, uh, after I finish speaking, staff will make a brief presentation. Then I will open the discussion to a public hearing and take public testimony from members of the public. Speakers are encouraged to speak to any item in the budget or any items on or off the checklist. You are also invited to comment on the policy recommendations of the Finance Committee that are shown on attachment C to the staff report. Following public comment, I will ask my colleagues on the council to go through the checklist and to pull any items or add any items that they would like to discuss separately, similar to a consent calendar process. We may straw vote those separate items. Following any straw votes, we will have an amended draft checklist before us, along with the proposed budget and the recommendations of the Finance Committee on several policy concepts. So the motion I uh, want, will want to hear at that time is to move the Finance Committee's recommendation to approve the budget as amended by the checklist. That same motion may include a ratification of the eight policy recommendations by the Finance Committee. Not all of these are specifically budget items, but guidance from the Council on them will assist staff in going forward with some of the initiatives. So if that's clear, Mr. City Manager, I will turn it over to you and our Finance Director. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members and members of the public. So um, we've gone through uh, long budget presentations a number of times with the Council as well as with the Finance Committee. So our presentation tonight is fairly brief. What I wanted to do um, was to put on the board what the checklist looks like. And again, I know we have a number of folks in the audience interested in the Newport Elementary project. So um, after I conclude and the mayor opens the public hearing, that's your chance to say that you think an item should be added to the checklist. Or uh, at the same time, I know that council members may have a particular item, as the mayor noted, that they may wish to discuss separately. So the checklist, uh, a number of these items will not, uh, probably not engender much discussion, but the, the top one up there is the transfer of the a general fund excess fund balance to the wastewater fund. Uh, that's something you guys have talked about in the past. And then I'm not gonna go through each one, but you'll see, as the mayor noted again, just amendments to the proposed budget. Um, and there's multiple pages of these. I think there's just three pages. That's the multiple. You see there's a, a allocation for Heroes Hall up here. Um, uh, the mayor has asked for some additional um, cleaning in the McFadden Square and Balboa Village area, and we've priced that out. So a number of those items, all of which would result in uh, a fairly sl small change, just a $27,000 reduction to the revenue side of the budget um, if the checklist was approved. Again, uh, Dan and I are here, to an and Susan, to answer any questions you might have about the capital improvement program, which is included in the budget, the budget detail itself, or uh, any item on the checklist or any item that the Finance Committee would have talked about. I do need to note that there's one of these items that I think uh, Councilmember Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon needs to recuse himself for. So if you ended up discussing that, it's the Peninsula Wireless Mesh Network. Um, well, Aaron can tell you how he'd like to handle it. And just briefly, what the FPPC says is that the decision on that project should be made first, 
and then you can discuss the rest of it with him here. So the way it would work is he would recuse himself from that item and leave, and then you would make a decision on it, then he can participate in the rest. How does that work with public comment, though? Would it? I'll probably best take public comment first okay. and then deal with this item. And then when it comes back up here, then we will start with that item. All right, is that okay. it? All right, uh, let's open it up to public comment. So please come forward. And if there are all of you here, if you'd want to kind of file your way down here so we can move through it quickly. So f please come forward. I'm sorry? Plug this in if this made any difference. <laughs> Uh, we, I know the council members have all seen the photos that have come in the emails, so we appreciate that. We've all that, received actually. those emails. Yeah. I think we all have seen them. <laughs> we, You're aware of the issue. Yes. I'll, I'll send you a copy of this. All right. So, um, Please identify yourself. My name is Adam Mickelson. Um, I, uh, I live on the peninsula. I've been a resident 15 years. I have children at... Talking to the mic. Yeah. I have Newport Elementary children, um, uh, but, and I'm a peninsula resident for the last 15 years. Um, First of all, I just wanted to say, like some of the other speakers, thank you for the work that's gone on on the peninsula uh, and the Balboa revitalization. It's fantastic. Marina Park is incredible. Leo Village is going to be great. Everyone uh, is ecstatic about what's going on, the farmer's market at the pier, so thank you. Uh, I'm speaking tonight not only uh, on behalf of the Newport L parents, but really on behalf of the peninsula community uh, about the park at Newport L. Um, I'll keep this short. You've seen the photos. You've seen the issue. Um, the, uh, uh, the park's completely out of... Um, uh, it's a sore thumb in the surrounding area. And this is a busy, popular park, which is used by both the city uh, and by the school district. Um, so something needs to get done. And the contrast with Peninsula Park and Sunset Ridge Park, it's pretty striking, as well as Marina Park. It's a, it's a stone's throw from it. Um, it's now got to a condition where it's fairly unsafe and, and unusable. Um, and I think that with Marina Park coming on stream, the amount of traffic and, and people in that area is only going to get busier. Um, you know about the plan to make it level uh, and usable to upgrade it. Uh, it would then be safe uh, and usable for not only the kids at, at Newport L, but all of the community in the weekends on holidays and, and for the whole of the summer. Um, we have Coastal Commission approval. The city took the lead on, on moving this through the Coastal Commission. Uh, the uh, permit for that expires in September 2017. So the clock is ticking um, on this issue. Um, parents who've sent uh, uh, letters to the council received a response about the lease uh, of the property from the district, from, sorry, from the city uh, to the district. Um, and um, the only point I would make to that um, issue is that uh, this is clearly shared public space. Uh, it's open 5,840 hours per year. It's available for school use under the lease for 1,620 hours, uh, and the practical use of the city is about 760 hours a year, so that's 13% of the available time. Uh, during school hours, all the users of the Park uh, residents of Newport Beach, their parents are residents of Newport Beach and, and taxpayers in Newport Beach. And so this is very much not just a Newport L issue, it's a community issue. Uh, all, uh, every day after school, all weekend and the whole summer, this is used by members of the public um, and by the whole community. And it's a very busy and popular park. I think it would probably be one of the more popular, busier parks in, in the whole of the city. So um, I'm asking that the timing is now uh, and asking that the city commit to funding the upgrade uh, um, as it sees fit. Uh, this is a district issue uh, and a city issue, and we'd ask for your consideration to make it a line item in the budget for this year. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Please come, f yeah, that's fine. Please come forward if you have any other comments, members of the public. <laughs> nah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> All right, any other public comments on the budget? Was there someone coming forward? No? Okay, please come forward. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Anne Marie Wallace Williams. I reside at 117 
excuse me, I ran back from the library, had to check out the book before it closed um, for my daughter. I uh, live at 117 Via Undine, Newport Beach. Um, parent of Beth Williams, kindergartner, just finishing up her first year at Newport Elementary. And first of all, thank you for Marina Park. Thank you for the uh, joining in on the stimulus package to dredge the bay a few years ago. It's made a huge difference on water quality where we live. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for the Balboa Library. Um, big fan. But this evening, I'm here to just let you know I'm also joining uh, the other parents and students at Newport Elementary that would like a level playing field, literally, <laughs> and a safe one for our community, um, not just the children, but for the whole community. Because even before um, Beth was a student there, we frequented the park, particularly to fly kites. And we were there um, two weeks ago. I picked her up from school. And we went out to that grassy area, and I was trying to find a place where we could. Our, our kite was really high. It was a beautiful day, blue sky. And we just wanted to lay down and look at the clouds and look at the kite. But I was struggling to find a, a, a nice grass patch to lay on because it was pretty, as you guys know, it's pretty messed up. So thank you for any help with that. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosher, since you seem to want some comments on the budget. Um, budgets are often complicated and confusing to the public. I have a suggestion, which I hope won't, uh, I, I don't think it involves any substantial change to the budget, but I'm actually not really sure. What, what I wanted to say, we have heard repeatedly in all the presentations that the big cloud hold, over the city and over the budget is the so-called unfunded pension liability. And I would hope that we have allotted in this budget enough that we could provide better visibility, better visibility to that issue on the city website. It actually it has some good information about pensions, pension primer thing, but it's very, very hard to find. And one, one would think the moment you click on budget, salary information, things like that, you would see an explanation from the city of what the problem is, what the unfunded pension liability means, how it affects us. And I don't think that takes a lot of dollars to do it, but it does take some commitment to make it visible to the public. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Max Mickelson. I am a sixth grader at Newport L and also a member of the student council at Newport L. Uh, as long as my as well as my fellow colleague Evan Richards. <laughs> and uh, one some reasons that we should level the field is, for obvious reasons, safety, and um, for other reasons, as um, in PE, physical education, we, uh, our PE teacher can't put down the lines for, the, for many of the games we play. She'll have to use cones instead of the regular soccer field lines or anything, and also um, we used to have ladybugs down in the uh, grass, and it used to be really cool seeing all the ladybugs, and now by me recalling from last year, there aren't any ladybugs anymore, so it's very sad. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I just want to mention that uh, Mr. Mickelson, the young Mr. Mickelson, was the star of their Newport L's musical last week weekend, which I attended, Susical the Musical, along with Miss Brown's daughter, <laughs> was the mayor. So thank you for um, being part of that successful musical and supporting your school. Any other public comments related to the budget? Hi, I'm Dina Barron, and I'm a parent at Newport Elementary. I'm also the PTA president. Yay, go Newport L. Um, it would really be, uh, honestly, it's been an honor to have the parks and all the area in front of our school redone. But when you go out to the blacktop and you go out to the grass area, it's an embarrassment. And now it, kids are getting injured there. And we had our field day and we have this beautiful beach there. And then we have this dead grass everywhere. And honestly, my kids comes home with cuts on them and things like that. And 
we live in Newport Beach, and I think that we can step it up and do a field through you guys. And, you know, our parents are very upset at our school that our grass looks like that, and then come to our meetings, but we can't do anything on our end about it other than hopefully have you guys um, lend us a hand and help our community um, make this project happen quickly because we've had parents on, you know, an architect that took his time and dedicated hours and hours on this project for our school. So we'd appreciate you guys to put this on your budget for next year. Thank you. Do you Thank mind you. if I ask a quick question? Madam Mayor, uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, I understand the field condition and everything. What have you done as far as asking the school district to repair the field or the blacktop? Do you know? We have, but I'll let him address that better with you. I think you need to either. You need to come to the mic so yeah. the people at home can hear you. I'm just trying to get a picture on it if we're going to be looking at it from a budget standpoint. We've had discussions with the school district, and um, what they um, have done was interact with Mr. Kiff uh, at the city. So the discussions have happened directly between the city and, and the school district in relation to this issue. So you guys really haven't requested at a board meeting for Newport Mesa for them to fix the field? Oh, so they're doing this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. And we'll come back. That's a very important question. Any other comments related to the budget? Come forward, please. Nobody's moving. Okay. Uh, staff, Mr. Kiff, why don't you update all of us on the conversations you've been having with the school district and the situation with the lease and sure. really where we are on so, all this. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the, so uh, this came to our, our re attention recently by a, a number of the Newport um, L parents who came and met with us. And I, I grabbed our public works team and community development and recreation to talk about this proposal. It's about a, a $500,000 uh, proposal as we understand it. So that's, and it, it is a really significant proposal, I say that in a good way, to try and resolve this field's issues. And I'll just say anecdotally, when I first started to work at, in Newport in 1998, um, it was a project that I worked on, so it was a failure in other words, um, <laughs> that we were, I was working with council, then Council Member Ridgeway to try to solve the problem of the grass dying because of the sand, the blowing sand and the salt in the blowing sand. And we thought that a berm would help and um, so we did that. It worked for a little while, but this is just a really challenging place to go, grow grass. So setting that aside, the Newport L parents uh, worked and raised their own money to do a design which has a more significant barrier to the blowing sand for the field, to protect the field and indeed to level the field as they note. Um, I think everyone would be hopeful that that would work. I, I remain skeptical that it will work. So. Um, but in terms of my conversation with the district, remember that the, the recently entered into lease that we have with them does direct the district to maintain the field in the kind of order that would be typical of fields in Newport Beach. And I think we'd all agree this is not, this has not been a typical way, this is not a typically maintained field. It, it does look as bad as the pictures show it. So um, I've, I've had a couple of conversations with Dr. Navarro saying, um, can we make a deal here? Um, he, he is not committed to uh, me yet. He hasn't been unfriendly at all or unwilling, but um, he's a, he hasn't committed to any dollars at this point in time. But we have talked about it at least a couple times. We have our school city meeting coming up where it's, I think it's number one on the agenda. Um, on the condition of the grass, so that's not necessarily only related to the cut back on watering? Uh, it's looked this bad for a while. Forever. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the park there? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Dave, so help me understand. I mean, it's kind of like, why did this field get in such bad shape? Basically, am I hearing this right? It's, as I understand, it's, it's state Thailands, which we're in charge of as the city. And yes, it's a difficult situation with sand and everything blowing, but it's totally the responsibility of the school district to maintain it? The language in the lease says that the district needs to maintain the field in good condition and order in a manner similar to uh, and commensurate with the field maintenance standards in the rest of Newport Beach. So is the school district saying that they're incapable of maintaining it? Uh, not necessarily. What, uh, th 
this is a fairly recent lease, but you know, arguably we should have been communicating with them more directly to say that the field is not in that standard and you need to bring it up to that standard. And we kind of have uh, this kind of joint powers, of <clears throat> excuse me, agreement with the school district on several fields throughout the city, right? That's right, and um, if, if uh, uh, Director Detweiler is here, she knows that better than I do in terms of how that works. So again, sometimes they own it, we maintain it, sometimes we own it, they maintain it, and this is a situation where we own it and the school district is supposed to maintain it. That's correct. Uh, and so you think that we just maybe haven't been on top of it, making sure they maintain it, and all of a sudden it's gotten so bad that everybody's coming unglued? I don't know if other, if any of the department directors that look at this more closely than I do could help me there. I don't know the, um, how, how recently it's, it's looked like it's in this condition um, it, this, from the photos, whether that's the last six months or 18 months or 24 months or longer. Whether it's been a gradual degradation or it happened last right. semester. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right. Mr. Selich. Uh, Dave, um, why is, <coughs> excuse me. Why is this field so hard to maintain when we have grass down at the Balboa Pier and we seem to maintain that okay? Remember at the Balboa Pier, there's a lot bigger buffer between the sand, the blowing sand, and the, um, you've got a parking lot, and you've got um, the approach cement to the pier, and you've got the restrooms where the parking lot are, that the peninsula, uh, the, the peninsula park it has a much greater buffer, hundreds, at least 50 to 75 to 100 feet from the, the sand. The Newport L uh, field is right up against the sand. It does have a blacktop area, but the uh, sand is able to blow right across that blacktop very easily. So if there were fire pits over there, Ed, it would mm -hmm. it'd be okay. It's, <laughs> right. And so you don't think the barrier that they're talking about is going to keep... Oh, I think it'll help. I think it'll help. I, I'm, I just remain skeptical that there's anything that's going to truly solve this problem unless we did artificial turf there. But I, I don't think that's as desirable to the families. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. How much will their idea cost? Uh, it, the total project is about half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Yeah. And that's our, es our initial estimate with our public works engineers. You're skeptical that it's going to last. Um, I, th I think it'll last for a little while, but um, like the, the 19... 1998-99 fix, that didn't last very long. That lasted maybe four or five years until it entered into a state not dissimilar to what it's in now. It would fluctuate. What will AstroTurf cost? Do you, if you know. You may not know. We need some help from Dave. I don't know, it'd be substantially more, probably, we won't have the drainage issues we normally have because of the sand, but the, it's, it's probably 10 bucks a square foot for the turf itself. But it is a lot easier to maintain because we're just vacuuming off the sand versus watering and regrading. Thank you. So Wait, 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 let oh. me get that right. So if we did uh, artificial turf, we would be paying for it, but it would be easier to maintain and the maintenance obligation is the school district. That doesn't make any sense either. Um, can, uh, let's talk about the discussion with the school district. Uh, do they acknowledge that the lease uh, agreement? I, I sent it to them and reminded them that, yeah. <laughs> so you have not had yet a conversation directly not with them? Not a detailed one. Remember, they're, they're finishing up school, and I try not to hassle them too much. We, we do have a good working relationship, but part of that is involved at, letting everybody kind of do their thing. I did ask to hear back by now, but and it is the last week and they're quite busy. Okay, so when, as we proceed and when we come back up here, we could talk about what the council would like to do about this. Any other public comments? Okay, please come forward. And anyone else who wants to speak, please come be prepared to speak. Did I close off? I, oh, I apologize. I'm sorry, I've already closed the public hearing. I apologize. I thought we were just clarifying on that item. I apologize. All right, so bring back up to the council. Let's now, first of all, I want to thank members of the public for being here and being interested in our important document as the budget is and appreciate your input. input. So let's take up the checklist. So the first thing you'd want to do then is that mesh network question. If you feel that there's any question or debate about that, while well, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon recuses himself, and then then you can 
the, uh, Mr. the pro tem can come back and talk about all the rest of them. All right, so you're putting on the screen. Well, just just briefly, uh, Councilmember Dune has a conflict related to his uh, employment related uh, to that item. All right, so this is the third line item on the maintenance and operations page, $150,000. So our action is to right there. approve this or not, or comment on it, um, discuss it. See if, if folks want to... Uh, pull it from there or if they're comfortable oh, leaving see. it on the checklist and then adopting the checklist as a whole. Well, Madam Mayor, yes. I, I, ha I have to feign a bit of embarrassment. I am the chair of the finance committee and I don't even, where did that come from? Uh, th this is a request from the police department and the information technology division and it, um, you'll, we'll have to have the police chief t talk exactly about what this will do for us, but it's an enhancement to the was this the vetted through service. the finance committee? Um, yes, it came to the finance committee. Did it really? Yeah. Okay, I was sleeping Sorry. then, I guess. I, There's a I lot know. that goes through the finance committee. Madam Mayor, I would love to hear uh, an explanation from police. All right, we have the police chief on his. It could be uh, Mr. Stafford. Mr. Stafford is here. Appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Oh, pardon me for a second, I've been sitting for a while. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I can answer any questions or I can just give you a brief outline of the project. Whichever you... Brief outline. What is it? And <laughs> uh, currently the police department has in place uh, several nodes of a wireless, me wireless mesh network that covers the safety enhancement zone on the peninsula. And we put this in place two years ago uh, as a backbone for cameras for the 4th of July. And uh, these nodes are in place permanently. It's five nodes. They are essentially Wi-Fi nodes that uh, communicate with each other, creating a mesh network. This proposal is to carry that mesh network all the way down the peninsula and over to Corona Del Mar State Beach, excuse me. Um, essentially expanding the nodes uh, will, light the wi will light the peninsula on the beach side uh, with Wi-Fi all the way down oh. for the city network. Uh, and, and the devices that will operate on the city network um, could be anything that currently operates in the city network from cameras to, um, sorry, cameras to uh, anything that, uh, any of the public works uses, but in particular the most important um, use that we've seen for it yet is potential fire uses uh, and lifeguard uses. Lifeguards with their EPCRs, paramedics with their EPCRs, uh, and also their MCTs, their in-car computers that run on the lifeguard CAD system, as well as um, the lifeguard towers themselves. <clears throat> We've done um, some research. We believe that the lifeguard towers can run VoIP, Wi-Fi VoIP phones. They're currently wired network. They're actually a line that runs under the sand <coughs> or over the sand, and uh, we'd be able to replace those if we can get the proof of concept to work, which we think we can. Um, so this would essentially light the entire peninsula with, with city Wi-Fi, secure Wi-Fi for city use. Which is not currently there, so this is an upgrade to the current wireless. It is, it is an expansion of the wireless network that we have in place in the safety enhancement zone for a particular need for the 4th of July that has remained in place. Um, and the particular issue that it addresses is the cellular saturation of the peninsula. So the devices that would run on the city Wi-Fi are devices that currently run on cellular on any given Saturday and especially on holiday weekends. The cellular um, towers are saturated. Cellular tower on the peninsula is completely saturated. Mr. Piatter, did you have any clarifying questions? So that was, that was the question, why weren't we using cellular? So even patrol cars, any, any city uh, computer access via camera or equipment uh, access this all the time, I presume? They don't go to the cell system at all if they're within reach of, an, of, of a current node. City devices that are not in secure network, the police department's computers run on a separate secure network, mm -hmm. at least from Verizon, and it would not replace that, but it could operate on that in a non-secure mode. But all other uh, Wi-Fi devices from VoIP phones to iPads to any kind of device that uses Wi-Fi could use that so long as it's set up on the city network. So if there was another cell tower on the peninsula, would that solve our problem? 
Not with the level of saturation that we have with cell phone use on holiday weekends. That's unlikely. So you'd need two more cell towers. That's probably a question for the telecom experts, but uh, we haven't found that cellular is, uh, works well for us at all, especially on holiday weekends uh, and, and any given Saturday in the summer. We're not using this for emergency communications at all. It is strictly cameras, security, computers. Cameras, cameras are a limited use, and the cameras would actually be used more by lifeguards. The cameras that we did put in with the, um, with the prior cellular project and with um, the, the nodes that we put in for the 4th of July that are still in place, they actually benefit the lifeguards. So the direct benefit for, the, for any cameras that we use would actually be the lifeguards, and secondary would be law enforcement use. And the lifeguards need a wireless because what? The lifeguards, actually, they are the ones that use the cameras. Uh, so they monitor the cameras from the lifeguard headquarters. It, it's a force multiplier, extra eyes on the beach. Uh, they, can get to, they can take a look at a scene before they arrive or supplement the eyes that they already have on the ground. And a wireless is the most economical way to do it? Absolutely. It, it, less expensive. It's an initial commitment up front, but it's less expensive in the long run than cellular subscriptions. And more functional. And, and the reason I'm asking this, other cities like Anaheim have tried to put in a Wi-Fi citywide only to fail, withdraw, and close down their system. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the difference is. I, I couldn't answer that, Mr. Piotr. I do know that uh, the scope uh, and uses for this system are not meant to be municipal Wi-Fi. It is meant for specific purposes for city devices, not as... Um, not as an alternative to sell for everybody, just for the city. Precisely. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Petros, did you have a question? I don't have a question. I've got uh, an opinion. Okay. I, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at parents who want to have their kids play on grass. Um, I'm, I'm hearing that you know, this is something that is a, a want, not a need. I, we have clearly uh, been operational with these services or services like them. Uh, in the past, this is $150,000. I feel like we're trying to find pennies in the couch to try and fund a $200 million budget. And I would just like to suggest that, that this is something that we can maybe put on hold for a year at least. Which must be. Yeah, uh, is the reason this is on, this is for the city manager, the uh, checklist is because it was not deemed of a priority enough. Not, to put not at all. It was my mistake. It should have been approved uh, as the part of the I, full yeah. items that would have gone in the proposed budget. I don't see it as a want. I see it as an important need in terms of, of making sure we have the communications capacity we need it during busy summer weekends. And maybe the fire chief can <laughs> chime in more. In, in regards to our, our lifeguard services, we have 38 towers on the beach that run off copper wire. It is not uncommon for that, those wires to break, and they do all the time. We have municipal services out there moving towers, trying to dig up the wire. We have looked for a way to replace the telephone communication in those towers for many, many years, and really have had no success in coming up with a good alternative. Until the police department came up with this mesh network, we had switched the phones in the towers to VOIP, which are very inexpensive to run, would completely eliminate our old copper wires that are hanging from those towers. So I think as far as an operational aspect for our lifeguards to have good communication, not just the cameras, not just our, our uh, patient care reports that are now mobile, it's our communication within those towers so we have a safe operation on the beach. So it's something we've looked at for a long time and have been unsuccessful to determine a good answer until Mr. Stafford came up with a solution for us. So it is valuable, it is necessary, and it would enhance public safety. All right, any other questions from the council? If you're taking straw polls, I move that we keep it in the checklist. I think we should well, probably just go ahead and vote on this one since there seems to be some. Um, are we going to vote electronically or vote by a straw vote? Hand vote. I think it's fine to straw vote it. Okay. Right. Someone want, do we need to do motions? Do we need a second? Or? No. Okay. All in favor of keeping it in the budget, the mesh network? Raise your hand. Okay. The straw vote passes 6-0. Okay. All right, we can bring Mayor Pro Tem back. Uh, so now, Mr. Kiff, we're going to go through uh, and ask each council member if there is an item on this checklist that they would like more extended conversation. And if so, we will pull those items. 
In, including um, items that you've seen throughout the rest of the budget, whether there's something on the CIP that you have concerns or questions about or want to add or subtract, you, what you would do then would be to put that up as a checklist item, and it could be a deletion as well as an addition. So um, at, now would be the time to do that. So you're saying two things, the checklist and the CIP List. Yeah, because if you if you decide that there's say an item in the CIP that you have a concern about and you want it deleted, it would go up on the checklist as a deletion. If that makes sense. I see. All right. Any comments from the council members? Mr. Selich. I'd like to discuss the uh, wastewater transfer out transfer in. Okay, any other item to be polled for discussion? Any, Mr. Piatter, Mr. Duffield, Mayor Pro Tem? All right. Are we gonna take them one at a time or do you want them all out on the table now? Well, let's put them all out on the table and then we'll go down the list just like we would in a consent poll. Mr. Petros, did you? There's nobody who's raised one. Let's go ahead and vote on the balance of this, All right, please. Well, I, they're, let's let's they're go. They're looking for the particular item. Are you ready? I just wanted to ask about the deferring the replacement of the docks. Okay, so there's a CIP item under uh, Parks, Harbors, and Beaches, and it's... Um, it's item... Uh, it's on page 54, item 10101. 10101. Harbor Piers and Gangway Maintenance. It's a budget of uh, $300,000. I think Mr. Duffield's request was that that not be done this year. Is that your request? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, any other comments? Well, is that the... Well, are we going to talk about this then later? Is that the idea? The, Mr. Uh, Duffield's... Talk about them separately. We're, I think, we're the ganging point. them now, and then okay. we're going to go through them. Okay. okay. Uh, do you have any other items? To poll or comment, I would like to add to our discussion then discussion of the Newport L Park and some portion of co-sharing with the school district. So I'll add that to the item. Okay, any other items? No, we will now go through the items. Second Mr. fresh start, I'd like to talk about that. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Kiff, if you wanna read off the items we're discussing. Sure, the items to be discussed would be the partial fresh start per Mr. Piotr, uh, Mr. Selich and the general fund transfer of fund surplus to the wastewater enterprise fund, Mr. Duffield, um, the CIP allocation of 300,000 for Harbor Pier and gangway maintenance, and Mayor Dixon asked about the, um, a cost share for the Newport Elementary uh, field. Okay. The amount to be determined, sorry. All right, let's uh, take the first item, the, well, which well, is the wastewater. Why don't we approve the rest of the checklist then? Get the rest oh, of the checklist okay. approved. Would that be no. the better procedure? Uh, well, let, let me uh, get Aaron's and Dan's help. It was my thought that you would approve the amended checklist and the budget all in one vote. Because the well, checklist I was just looking at a straw budget. vote to approve the rest of the checklist. Oh, I see. Okay. Is there any problem with that? I guess the only other item is that if there's other items that people would like to pull to have specific discussions on on the checklist. And then they go back on uh, some yeah. of these items. Uh, may no, go you back did. On you, the, you did additional items. I don't know if anyone wants to talk about. Uh, it. They, oh. uh, a couple of them, like uh, Mr. Selich pulled one of the items okay. from the checklist, so I think right, that's apologize. covered. That's okay. So where are we? You are. You could vote on a straw vote on all of the other items on the checklist that have not been set aside or pulled. <clears throat> All right, then we go through these items and then we would add or subtract them back to the original checklist and then combine those with the full budget. Okay. I move we approve the rest of the checklist. Well, second. I, wait. Okay. We have, All right. Okay. Call for, for the, the sake of discussion, I believe we should do it the way that Mr. Kiff says. I want to see what I'm voting on entirely um, after the results. Net, net. After we've added and subtracted. Okay, technically what we're voting on will just be... A, putting this, as, we'll vote on it, the checklist, but it could still be amended as we go through this, can, these polled discussions. Is that correct, Mr. Kiff? Uh, that's correct. All right, so do we still want to vote on 
straw vote on the checklist as it exists now without the polled items. Yes. Okay. Do we have a second? We have a second. Let's do a voice. Do we do a straw vote? Okay. All in favor of the items remaining on the checklist. I'm sorry, just for a point of clarification. Are we voting on voting on the items? That's how I interpret that. All you're doing is, vote, is straw voting them to, 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 so that they don't need any more discussion. That's okay. The, when you say they, you mean all items that were not withdrawn for discussion. Exactly. We're voting on all of them now. Yes. Yeah. I thought we were voting on the process. Right. It, am I confused here? No, you're not. It happens all the time, so it's okay. No, no, you're I not, am. Mr. Muldoon. You're not confused. Okay, so yeah. point of clarification, what are we voting on exactly? My understanding is you're voting on everything on the checklist that hadn't been re removed. Yeah, you're, and it's a straw vote, so you're saying all these items that have not been removed are acceptable to you to move forward with a motion at the end, and you would have a later motion to approve these as a part of the budget. Okay. Okay, so let's do a voice vote on these items on the checklist to approve. Raise your hand. Aye. With Council Mayor, right, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon voting no, the straw vote is 6-1. Okay, now we'll go to the polled items. And the first one item was the wastewater uh, general fund <coughs> transfer out. I believe that's what your item was? It, it is. Um, I'm probably on the short end of this one, but I really do have a philosophical opposition to uh, to what we're doing here, and it's really twofold. One is I think it's, um, it's bad public policy to um, take general fund money and use it to subsidize enterprise funds. I think the, um, you know, the sewer fund uh, has some issues. I think there's some structural changes that need to be made to it. I've made some suggestions to the staff over time, but we haven't done anything about it. And um, so I think that's one issue. And then the other issue I have is that it really isn't fair to the people in the city that uh, are not part of our water system. And uh, we have over 30,000 water connections in the city, about 25,000 or 82% is our, our city connections. And then the other 19% is uh, Irvine Ranch Water District in, in Mesa. So if we were to take that uh, $3.5 million and divide it by the number of city services, that means that uh, we're giving our, the people that have Newport Beach Water Service a $140 benefit, which doesn't seem like a lot dollar-wise, but it's kind of a principal thing. And uh, if we were to m make the Irvine Ranch Water District and the Mesa Water District people whole, then we should be contributing to their enterprise fund at $140 a, a water unit service, and that would be another $784,000. And so that means that the number should be, rather than $3.5 million, it should be about $4.2 million. Of course, there's another way to look at it, and that is if we only have $3.5 million to spend, you divide that by the total number of water services, that's $115 a house, and uh, we put uh, $2.8 million into the city water fund, and we give uh, the uh, residents in Irvine Ranch Water District and Mesa Water District $629,000, that's $115 a house. I think if I was someone that lived in that area, which I'm not, I live in our water service area, I'd be kind of ticked if I saw that the city was uh, taking my general fund money and subsidizing only a portion of the water service users in the city. Now, I had asked the city manager at the last meeting for some solutions, and he hasn't come up with any, and maybe he misunderstood my request. But, um, you know, I could support a loan uh, till we get the water system fund squared away rather than just a direct uh, grant to the uh, enterprise fund. Uh, it's something we've done before, well, not with enterprise funds, but uh, with the Tideland Fund, we've loaned money to the Tideland Fund for dredging. Um, the other option, which I don't particularly like, is that we would increase the amount of um, transfers out and transfers in to $4.2 million so that we can give everyone a $140 credit or we decrease and go down to give everybody a $115 credit. To me, it seems the most logical thing would be to do a loan right now until uh, we can get this mess squared away. But um, if we do anything other than a loan, then I would not be supporting this. All right, any other comments on this matter? I'm sorry, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. 
Uh, last time Councilman Selich asked for a staff report, I uh, was sort of rude in my apologies for that and saying that I thought it was an impossible equation. You've done, I think, as good a job as you could do, Councilman Selich, on what the equation would look like because you can draw solid lines based on water users and which district they correlate to. My position, in addition to the water fines and people who are on fixed income who have a tough time uh, doing anything more than what they do right now, especially with inflation and other food cost issues, is that water is used by everyone. So the general fund is contributed by a lot of entities. Um, and water is used by visitors and residents. The water fund uh, essentially gets used from those who, um, including the city, um, are using it, but they may not have a ticker in front of them. So I think this is a great example of um, sort of an impossible equation, uh, although I think Councilman Selich makes great points. Um, I think it's okay to occasionally cut some red tape and apply the surplus to infrastructure needs. Thank you. Mr. Curry. Well, this is the sort of the fruit of the poison tree where we failed in our responsibility to make the sewer fund adjustment. Mr. Piotr wants to talk about we should have done it in 2007. We should have done it in 2007. I don't think that was actually before us as a decision. But we should do it now because what we're now seeing is the need to take general fund money and, uh, and, and, and subsidize and deal with the structural deficit that we created through our own malfeasance and our own uh, inability to adapt the sewer fee revenues that we should have adopted as were recommended by staff on two occasions. So uh, I share Mr. Selich's uh, 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 discomfort uh, with uh, this subsidy. Uh, I think the thing that we need to do is quickly bring back to the council an appropriate, uh, and he had some suggestions on how we could address some of the inequities as he saw in the fee, uh, a fee proposal so that we can have our enterprise uh, run like a business. Everybody says we want to run the city like a business. This is running it at a structural deficit, which is a failing business. And so that's what we need to do uh, to uh, fix this uh, problem. So I I share Mr. Selich's concern. I do understand the need to keep this, and this is a sewer fund, by the way, not the water fund. And we need to, uh, to do the responsible things uh, that we need to do to uh, run the city responsibly. Mr. Piotr. I agree. I think it ought to come out of the sewer fund and we ought to raise the sewer fees. Um, you know, it's too bad that we spent so much on City Hall and didn't worry about fixing our sewers in the past, but it's what's done is done. The sewer is, or the, the sewage is past the bridge. I guess the question would be, uh, Mr. Selich, are, are you interested in, uh, you know, perhaps a, a tax cut in the general fund that would be commensurate with a sewer tax increase? Well, I'm not, all, the, all that I'm saying here, Councilmember Piotr, is that I think given the situation we're at now, the responsible thing to do is make this a loan to the sewer fund and then you know, go back and take a look at it and uh, figure out if there's a better solution and then the, uh, the general fund can be paid back over time. That's, that's my suggestion. Um, Mr. Kiff, can I ask you a question? Uh, I think I asked this before. If there were to be a sewage, a sewage line break, and of course it's just a matter of moments before it goes into the harbor and then how would that be repaired and where would the money come from if the infrastructure fund is, the cupboard is bare, how does that get paid for? So we would certainly repair it. Um, it, is, uh, it is not beyond the, the pale or the possibility that we would come to you with an emergency request and we would we'd go into the red and the sewer fund and, um, and indeed have to do a, a fund transfer another way. Um, and then question number two, because the prior councils, maybe plural, I know as late as 2009, did not approve, for whatever reasons, a rate increase. And the, the reason I support this transfer is because I, to normalize, instead, what, what we, let me back up, when we were voting on the sewer rate, wastewater rate increase several months ago, it was a ramp up because of the failure of prior councils to approve the rate increase. So it was making up for lost time from 2009 or 10 to 2016. And that burden is being placed on residents, fixed income or, or not. It's just, it's an extraordinary burden. So I do support, because I would like the city attorney to confirm that it is legal and ethical to transfer these funds to normalize the balance, the declining, soon to disappear budget in the wastewater infrastructure fund. So then when we do 
come before us later this year with a proposed rate in, a wastewater rate increase that will be normalized to to the extent of what the rate would have been had there been a rate increase that began in 2009. So I think uh, this is all kind of the, the lesser choice of all of us, but I do want to be fair to the residents. Uh, if there is a sewer break, a wastewater line break, the entire city, one way or the other, would be out of the general fund. Residents from other parts of the city would be responsible. As Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon said, uh, people all over the city use the wastewater system, flush the toilets, et cetera, et cetera. So water goes down the drain, so we're not, there's no meter on every public facility that determines where that user comes from. So this, to me, the objective is to restore, first and foremost, most importantly, to restore our wastewater infrastructure fund. This is just really uh, ludicrous that we are spending months and months and months staff time in the thousands of hours to try to figure this out when we do, fortunately, due to good management, have a budget surplus that we can al allocate to a lot of important priorities and one-time only payments. I do not see this as a trend. I see it as a one-time only event. I'm on the record saying that right now. Let's restore this fund so we can make sure that our wastewater lines can be maintained and serviced and repaired and replaced as needed as would be accustomed and typical for our city. So that I would be my statement on the matter to keep it as it is proposed on the checklist. So, any other comments, Mr. Selich? Yeah, Mr. Kiff, to be clear, this three and a half million dollars, it's not to go into a fund to repair potential broken sewer lines. It goes into our, our capital sewer fund. We have scheduled maintenance projects to be done. We'd correct? like, uh, uh, correct. We would like to bring the reserve level in that fund back up, and we'd also like to fund the uh, planned capital improvements associated with the master plan for the coming year. Okay, thank you. And again, the first way to do this, if you want to be fair to all the residents, the taxpayers, the ratepayers, is to do it as a loan. Thank you. All right. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, so do we take a straw vote on keeping this item in the, on the checklist? That would be the straw vote, yes. All right, raise your hand if you are in favor of keeping it on the checklist. With Council Members Selich, Curry, and Petros voting no, it'll be kept on the checklist for three. Okay. Moving forward then to the partial fresh start item, which is was part of the Finance Committee unanimous recommendation to uh, begin a fresh start. I mean, Mr. Kim, so we, we do, did, um, and because Mr. Piotr brought this to my attention that he wanted to talk about a little bit. We do have a slide up above you that, that really tries to frame the two pension contribution choices. One is the, I was, it's, really, it's called the default choice. I didn't really like that term, but it's a phase in that rolls in mortality studies, and I'm getting too jargonish here, but mortality study is what, when PERS looks at, looks at how long our employees are living and when they're retiring and um, when, how the, long the retirees are living in retirement. That's called a mortality study. That has resulted in an increase to our costs. So the partial fresh start that's proposed within the budget would, um, would opt out of that five-year deferment schedule and do a more rapid payment of that in part so we don't slip into negative amortization territory with our unfunded liability. So very complex, and I apologize that it's complex. Dan's way smarter than I am about this, but you see the net present value savings. Uh, many cities will select the phase in because they can't afford it, or and that's or could be a, another political choice. I don't say that pejoratively. I'm just, just stating that. Uh, we felt uh, that we could recommend the partial fresh start because we did have some resources to fund that. And there's kind of the pros and cons. Again, PFS standing for the partial fresh start. All right, and I just want to add, as I said a moment ago, the Finance Committee did endorse the partial fresh start by a unanimous vote. So any comments up here? Yes. I didn't see your name. Okay, Sorry. Mr. Piotr. Uh, Dave, can you tell us, it looks here that it's a partial fresh start. Its duration is only four years? I'm going to ask Dan to help me out. So, 
The, the duration of the payback uh, would be tw 20 years. The first four years, we would be paying more. However, um, the, the next 16 years, we'd be paying less since we're paying more up front. So when we start a fresh start, and I believe the dollar amount was, what, $2.7 million a year, we're paying that voluntarily, and we're paying that, let's say a year from now, we decide we wanted to put that 2.7 towards a uh, you know seawall replenishment fund. Can we stop paying that 2.7 and go back to the phase-in? Well, the phase-in, of course, only work is uh, only a four-year period. So once that period is done with, our payment would actually be lower than it would otherwise be no, for the next six I years. Next year, if we wanted to, could we go to the other path, the default path? If you start a formal fresh start, which would be akin to a refinance, no, you would not. There's another option, which is to just make an additional mortgage payment, pay, pay an amount like um, the the two point seven million dollars that you, you you would um, would accomplish the same thing where it would avoid the fresh start, but you're not locked into the new payment schedule. So why wouldn't we do the extra mortgage payment, like you say, rather than locking in and refinancing? Uh, do we gain anything by refinancing? Do we get a lower interest rate or something? Uh, no, um, it, it has the same impact, but over time there will be multiple uh, gains and losses, and it'll just it would get complicated over time. If you want to uh, pay at a uh, level at which you would amortize this this loss over uh, uh, a fixed period of time, this is, uh, in my opinion, the easiest way to do it: to, to lock it in and and uh, make a direct path for it. So you're saying with the fresh start plan, the $2.7 million a year varies? We're going to have different size payments every year for 20 years? So it will continue to go down. In fact, by year five, it would below, be below the payment you would be otherwise making on, that, uh, on the um, mortality loss. The mortality loss is about $40 million. Um, <coughs> and you're paying it off over a 20-year period. So their what actuaries doing, came and said, hey, everybody's living longer, we need more money because we have to make more payments, and your sh share in Newport Beach is 40 million bucks. Correct. And if we wanted to pay the 2.7 in a fresh start, we're committed for, it's a 20-year duration, is that what I'm hearing? It, well, the, the, the alternative is to pay less now for four years and pay a higher amount for 16, so you can pick your poison. And they really have offered that to cities that they felt could not handle financially the partial fresh start. Cities, they're saying, look, we've, we've paid all we can this year, so give us a break, and the break, in effect, costs those cities more down the road. So they've got a different payment schedule to make up their shortfalls versus what we're talking about. Correct, they, they would ramp it up more slowly, but they'd also pay for that ramp up in the out years. We're proposing the fresh start to avoid the, again, the negative amortization and funded liability. So if we wanted to pay the 2.7 <clears throat> voluntarily without committing to a refinance, we would still have the better rates and we wouldn't be paying more later. It's just that we wouldn't have a commitment to make the payment if for some reason we didn't want to. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Curry. Well, I, I, it's important that everybody focus on how staff characterize what happens if we don't follow through with this is we will negatively amortize our pension liability. It will go up. Our debt will increase. And much like some of the other ideas that we've seen from Council Member Piotr that would increase our borrowing costs or increase our uh, subsidies from the general fund and operate things at a structural deficit, this will have financially damaging impacts to the city. I want to, uh, this is an issue where the mayor and I are in agreement. I want to commend the finance committee because they actually took the time to study this, to look at this, your appointees, and they unanimously reached the decision that we should follow the staff's recommendation. Staff, by the way, is not re recommending that we not do this. They're recommending that we do it because it's an effective way to solve a big financial issue in the city's budget. So we should, uh, do the responsible thing, 
uh, we should exercise some financial literacy here on, and, and, and coherence, given some of the other ideas, and we should pass this the way it's proposed by staff so that we do not begin negatively amortizing our pension liability, which is our biggest financial issue in the city, follow the recommendations of the Finance Committee, who acted in a unanimous and responsible way, and move forward with this on the budget. Uh, wait, wait, we have a Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. I just want to give Dave a hard time for the fact that this is the default plan. I mean, that's, that's pretty entertaining. But in all seriousness, I support the plan. Good, dis good fiscal discipline. I appreciate it. Thank you. So if you were straw voting this, this Wait, is... Mr. Piatra has oh, a sorry. comment. Did you want to make a comment? I support paying the... and not negatively amortizing a, a much against Mr. Curry's, uh, you know, painting of this issue. Um, but I would like to, just like if, we, if you had a mortgage at home, you wouldn't... you'd make that voluntary payment, but you wouldn't commit unless you got a benefit from it. We're not getting a reduced interest rate. We're not getting any benefit by making the commitment. It makes no sense to make the commitment when we can get achieve the same thing without it. Uh, that allows us flexibility in a rainy day if and when it should happen. And I know that the Finance Committee is, is bringing on an actuary who'd be able to look at all of our options to see if there are other alternatives, maybe none, uh, but at least we would have the option. Uh, by committing to this, you're unnecessarily marking $2.7 million a year to something that you cannot change your mind on later or retrieve. So until the actuary gets on board at the Finance Committee, until we look at all the other options, why make the commitment? It just doesn't make sense. Uh, Mr. Petros. And that is precisely why there's a misunderstanding here, Mr. Piotr. The benefit is, in fact, the commitment to pay this. If we were to pay it one year and didn't pay it the other year, it would negatively amortize out in the out years. The whole process of the fresh start is the follow through. The follow through to pay the higher payments over the next four years so that in fact the city, the taxpayers do receive the benefit in the out years. If we were not to make that payment in year two, three or four, the payments on the out years would be greater. That flexibility that you're seeking is in fact creating the issue that you so desperately want to avoid, higher tax increases for the people. The fresh start is the way to go for that, and that is why your appointee voted for this. All right, shall we call for the straw vote? So I hate to be overly precise here, but since this is part of the budget, the vote would be, do you put it on the checklist to delete it? So if you're... If that were your motion, I think that's Mr. Piotr's motion. So if you supported that, you'd vote yes. If you voted, if you did not support it and voted no, it would stay in the budget. It's in the budget right now. It is. Okay, it's not on the checklist. It's actually in the totals Correct. of the budget. Okay, so we vote yes to take it out of the budget. If you were supportive of Mr. Piotr's request, you'd vote yes to put it on it. the checklist as a deletion. And no of the budget. is to keep it into the budget. Right. Okay, all those in favor of keeping, uh, of taking it out of the budget, raise your hand. Those in favor of keeping it in the budget. <laughs> I'm getting myself confused. All right. So that's six votes to one to keep it in the budget with Council Member Piotr voting yes. so we to keep, remove it from the budget. We, we will do the partial fresh start. Yes, okay. So the next item, Madam Mayor, I think is Mr. Duffield, Duffield's item um, about Harbor Piers and, ma and uh, maintenance. Do you, want to, do you want to comment on that, Mr. Duffield? Uh, I think it's a little deceiving when they talk about um, the, uh, what does it go again? The three words there, I don't have it in front of me. The capital improvement pier, program? It's the pier oh. and the yeah. Sorry, gangway. Well, the piers and the gangways have been replaced. So that's deceiving. We're talking about just the floating dock, and I have I've looked at them all, and they look pretty good to me for another twelve months. Okay, um, can I piggyback on that? Are there any other comments, Mr. Selich? I'm sorry. Yeah. Isn't this something that the Harbor Commission's looking at also? These floating docks. Can I read that somewhere? Or? Uh, 
this is this is our regular maintenance program of our of the city owned piers and mr duffield's belief is that they're in pretty good shape and we don't need to spend money on them this year so it's not about floating docks in the middle of the harbor no no i understand oh, that sorry. but i thought for, for some reason i thought that the harbor commission was looking at what the uh, replacement life should be of the, the, uh, there, the floating you're, docks. Sorry, you're right, Mr. Sellage. There's a recommendation from the Finance Committee that took a look at this, too, that said, indeed, there could be some merit to what Mr. Duffield is proposing and that the Harbor Commission should look at a different replacement schedule in the coming year. Okay. Well, I would, uh, you know, be in support of it, Councilmember Duffy, if we had the Harbor Commission take a look at it and get a report back to us, because I agree with you, another year they'll last. Mr. Curry. Well, I think I would be too, but I, uh, I hate for us to zero out the entire maintenance budget for this uh, portion of our capital uh, facility uh, simply on a whim uh, without having the Harbor Commission's input to it. I think that's not prudent. I think problems can arise during the course of the year that we'll need to address. And so this is not a, a good way to make budget decisions on capital improvements. I think uh, Councilman Duffield has some good suggestions, for example, in terms of how we uh, administer moorings. And this may very well be that we can reduce the cost for how we maintain our piers. But uh, you know that should be done through a thoughtful uh, deliberation by the Harbor Commission, not by simply zeroing out the entire maintenance budget for the year in, in advance. Well, Mr. Kiff, how would you suggest we deal with this? I mean, if the Harbor Commission looks at this, do we keep this item in a line item in a band, depending on the outcome of the Harbor Commission's review? Uh, I don't think that was Mr. Duffield's request. I think it was to to zero it, but to allow the Harbor Commission to, over the course of the next okay. several months, develop a different uh, maintenance plan or, uh, sorry, a, a replacement plan. Okay. All right, so we should be voting to strike that item from the checklist. Uh, very the precisely. CIP, the CIP very precisely, list. Precisely, yeah, if you, exactly. So if you voted yes, it would be stricken from the uh, CIP. Okay, so let's take a straw vote unless I see no comments. All those in favor of removing it from the CIP list, $300,000. This draw vote is 6-1 with Council Member Curry voting no. All right, and so the next item. So the last item that I have notes on would be the Newport Elementary field, and I think Mayor Dixon, you uh, had pro wanted to discuss this separately. This is not on the checklist, right. so your vote would be to add it to the checklist with a potentially an amount certain. Well, if my colleagues would agree for us to set aside I would say maybe two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of the three hundred thousand we just took out of the budget uh, to for you to use in discussions with the Newport Mesa Unified School District for funds to be directed to the re repair and reconstruction of the Newport L Park. I don't want to necessarily have to spend all that money. Let the school district contribute a lion's share, but at least set aside those funds to be determined. But I certainly welcome the input of my colleagues on that subject. If I could just make a brief comment, Madam Mayor. So um, the the item that you've just acted on before, the 300,000 was Tidelands. The Newport Field is, Newport L Field is also on Tidelands. So this would be um, in effect a, a net, um, net reduction of 50,000 if both of those uh, your concepts are done at once. Sorry, or, or this one follows that one. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Petros. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I am supportive of your proposal if it is and and in a manner that it's up to 250, and that that doesn't necessarily mean, as you rightly said, we don't go out and spend that all. That you know, clearly there is an obligation of the school district. Uh, I think we just we are taking on two hundred thousand dollars of really what the school district's obligation is, uh, but these are our residents, and they do benefit from this as do people uh, who are just visitors or who are down on the peninsula. So I don't want to play fast and loose with this money. I would like to. Uh, I'll be attending that that uh, meeting on Thursday. Uh, and we'll be very clear with the school district that they have an, the lion's share obligation here. And I would strongly encourage you 
to make the same hardcore press you made to me in your emails and your missives and your phone calls that you make to every one of those board members to get them to, to take on their lion's share. I, good comment. Uh, Mr. Selich. Yeah, I can support this if it's a 50-50 match. I think the school district should be, is that, is that yeah, your oh, intent? Yeah. 50, okay. Well, at least 50-50. Yeah, at least 50-50. Uh, Mr. Piotr. Okay, I just want to clarify the same thing as Mr. Selich. We're not going to give a dime if the school district doesn't spend a dime. We are only matching whatever they do up to 250. I, I can go along with that, yes. Yes. We're just Yeah, remember, th this is a budgeting versus an expenditure. You're setting aside, you're putting brackets around it saying it's for an equal, an equal contribution from the district. And actually, you guys as a council would let that contract later on. Okay, thanks. Okay, seeing no other questions, so the vote, the straw vote is to, why don't you restate to that? To place this on the checklist as a budget amendment of $250,000 that would be up, uh, sorry, up to, that would be matched 50-50 in an expenditure to complete the field project. Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. With Council Member Duffield and Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon voting no, carries five. Okay. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Selich. Yeah, I had one item I wanted to bring up and I forgot, so we've already approved the rest of the checklist, but I had one other item I wanted to consider adding on here. It's actually two items, and that's the uh, Historical Society, the 10000 for Newport Beach and 35000 for Belleville Island. You know, it isn't that much money for two citizen groups that are trying to uh, preserve the history of the city, so... I'd like to throw it out there and see if there might be some support for just putting it on our checklist as opposed to uh, making them go through that community. What's it called, the community grant program? That's right. I, what, may I ask, why, what's wrong with that? I don't think there's enough money in there. What's, what's, what's the amount budgeted? It's pretty tight, I, I think. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry, that's the big grant program. That's the big one. This is a small one. Tara, can you remind me? Some reason forty thousand. We think it might. Yeah. sticks in my mind. It, it forty is the total in that uh, grant fund. Yeah, we have a lot of other small organizations competing. So anyway, throw it out there. I know that they've requested it, and Mr. Swalstead got up under oral communications, and I think it's worth considering. But well, I I just I agree with you in concept. I just don't know if I personally like budgeting it this way because the only item like that, and it that's why we have a community grant. And maybe it begs the question: Should we increase our community grant allocation? Well, I'll only say this, that this is the way we've done it for the last 10 years I've been on the council. I know, and I never have understood that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, there's a lot I don't understand yeah. also. <laughs> All right. Mr. Piotr. Yeah, I'm just looking for clarification. So right now the budget does not include anything specifically for either historical society. Right. We have $40,000 for our community block, or grant, and basically Mr. Selich wants to add back in itemized for these two, like previous budgets evidently have been. Okay. It's uh, 35000 for Balboa Island and 10000 for Newport Beach. It's 35000 It's the request, correct. 35, and that's the whole budget for 40000 Or no, you're, these are separate. Excuse me, I apologize. 35, what will they do with 35000 Shouldn't we know more a little bit about this before we... Submitted a package to every council member on how it was going to be spent. I received mine. But that's a lot higher than it's been in the past, correct? It was 25000 last year, wasn't it, Dave? 25000 You want to go back to twenty five? I, I mean, I could go along with that, but they did request thirty five. I just wish it were part of the community budgeting. I wouldn't mind putting more funds into the community budgeting, but to do it this way as a checklist item, I don't understand. There are a lot of meritorious groups. Um, and I did not read it because I thought it was part of the community grant project. Well, we just did this budget process to take the peers away. It, it's no different. Well, no, I see this Doing is it a, on this a whim. Is, well, this is a nonprofit. So, I mean, it belongs in the community grant project. I'd be willing to support it. Okay. I, if you're going to do this, it should go into the community grant process and let them apply through that process. I won't support it either way. 
Well, my straw vote is to put it in the uh, put it on the checklist for thirty five thousand total. Like I say, I support supporting those two organizations. I would like it to be on the community grant. I just would like to put some discipline into that process instead of being one off for nonprofits in our community. Can we uh, add to that forty thousand somehow? That could be a substitute motion, I think, okay. on the checklist. Which is okay. This is what I'd like to say is so, add a substitute motion to find the commensurate amount of money to put into the community grant so that can be designated for the use for these two organizations. So the commensurate amount, I need some clarification on that. Mr. Selich uh, was... 10000 for <laughs> Newport Beach and 35000 for... Uh, or 25000 excuse me, for okay. Galboa Island. So that's clear. So the community grant amount, I think, Mayor Dixon, if you're comfortable with that, would would go up by 35000 They'd have to compete with... Yeah, well, correct. well, no. She's saying that they don't compete. That we're yeah, designating it, it for them. Just well, that, the two projects. Right. <laughs> That's All right. Correct. That okay. Yeah. That's what it takes to get her vote. I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> but one time only, because I got to review this in the following year. But I will do this. For, I, so that's my motion. So, the motion is to vote on that creation and upgrade to the community or what is the motion you yeah you, well I, you're you're in effect saying the same thing as adding into the checklist but if you wanted to just kind of change the discipline on it that's okay i think it your motion madam mayor was to increase the amount of the community grants program by thirty five thousand dollars with a reservation of 25 for the balboa island historical society and ten thousand for the newport beach historical society does that sound right yes yeah Okay, and then will we have a chance to review these when they come back in the community grant you discussion? Would, yes, because yeah, I have some comments yeah. to make at that time, which yeah. I'll hold. Because okay. again, this is not an expenditure. Right. Per se. Okay, all right. So let's call for the vote on what Mr. Kiff just. Oh, Mr. Piotr, you. Have yeah, I was just clarifying. Is it earmarked for them or not? In the community grant program. So it's part of the community grant program. We'll have a chance. They'll to have to submit like everybody else, but the money's theirs, assuming right. that their submittal's good. Yes, and we could review it at that time. And if we decide we don't like their submittals, that money goes back to the to the uh, contingency or reserves. Well, we could decide that, I suppose. Yeah, You're not I, obligated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I won't be supporting it. Thanks. Okay, so we'll call for the vote. All in favor of what Mr. Kiff just described in terms of allocating those funds to the community grant. With Council Member P uh, Piotr voting no, it carries 6-1. Okay, so now that we have amended the checklist, correct? We're all done with the checklist. Is there a motion to move? Well, maybe I want to turn this over to the chairman of the finance committee. Would you like to make a motion? Where am I? <laughs> so so if, if I can help, Mr. Petros, the, potentially you, you could have a motion to introduce right now that would approve the budget as amended by the checklist in accordance with the discussion you've just had over the last 45 minutes. And um, which, it, again, adopts yeah, the let, let me well. let me step back, and then uh, you can hold my hand uh, and give a little bit of context here. Uh, this discussion of this budget started before my taking over the, the chairmanship of the Finance Committee, and I would like to note uh, uh, Council Member Curry stewardship as we embarked on this uh, whole effort. Uh, since that time, though, there have been 11 meetings of the Finance Committee that did deep dives into each one of the department budgets. Each one of the department heads came and had to justify their overall budget to the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee is comprised of three members of this council as well as representatives from the remaining council members. So each member of this council had a representative there, Mr. John Warner, Patty Gorsica, Will O'Neill, and Larry Tucker were uh, on the finance committee representing their council members, and they were responsible to go back to the council members and make sure they understood what was done uh, on behalf of them in these meetings. So there, it was an accountability back, so everybody up here should have the same level of knowledge on what this budget says. I wanna talk briefly about the budget. This is a flat budget. There has been some talk about increasing revenues and increasing expenditures and expenditures exceeding revenues. That is simply not true. Uh, 
This budget is flat. The items in this budget that have increased include salaries and benefits and our pension obligations, items that this council has already voted on. <coughs> Folks, you've already voted on these things. So the balance of the budget, the discretionary parts of this budget, really are flat. There has been no change. So we have asked Mr. Kiff to hold the line on spending, and Mr. Kiff, thank you very much. You have done precisely that. At the same time you've done that, you have, been, you have presented a budget that is a good roadmap for us moving on to the future. It includes a reduction in six staff positions in the city, thus reducing further obligations down the line. It acknowledges that we may not necessarily be done with outsourcing, and there have been some good ideas uh, from the Finance Committee on other places we should look there. It does speak to our debt obligations by accelerating our payments. Folks, if this budget gets passed, we will be front-loading uh, our payments so that you and your children and your children's children will pay less in the future according to this process. We have also been uh, a, a CIP, that a capital improvement program that continues our investment in the infrastructure of this city. Roads are, are some of the best in the county, water delivery, street lighting, uh, all of the things that make Newport Beach beautiful and that make your property values go up year over year are included in this budget. It also includes an, an investment in public safety and our fire department, in the public arts, in all of the things that make Newport Beach the most desirable place in Orange County to live. With that as the backdrop, there's no reason not to support this budget, a flat budget that does all that. I would just like to compliment the Finance Committee on the work that they've done. I would like to compliment Mr. Kiff on putting together a budget that accomplishes so much for the next year and his department heads who have really shown fiscal discipline as we move forward here. And with that then, I would like to move approval of this budget, commensurate with the amended checklist. Ta-da. Um, and uh, there's a CEQA finding, that's with, B. With the with the appropriate CEQA finding, where am I? And, sorry, it's on t item 23, it's B, exempt. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that this is uh, exempt from CEQA. And I'd point out one other thing that you, you folks have actually talked a lot about indirectly, and that is whether you'd want to consider and if approve, if appropriate, approve the Finance Committee's recommendation regarding those eight policy items. That is, that is rolled into this motion. That would be part of your motion. That would be part of the motion. Second. Okay. Okay, I don't see anyone speaking, but I just want to, if I may, just echo uh, just a few comments Mr. Uh, Petros made to compliment him and, and Mr. Curry before him on both of your leadership of the Finance Committee. Thank you for taking that on, Mr. Petros, and getting us, getting us this far in the budget process. I also want to thank staff uh, for working to support all of these 11 meetings and community and, and public participation. I want to thank our public members who voluntarily serve uh, their own time and talent uh, for the city of Newport Beach. And we had four public members, Mr. O'Neill, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Warner, and Ms. Gorsica. So thank you for your continued uh, excellent financial expertise uh, that has led us, helped us get to this point. I do, notwithstanding Mr. Petro's good words, uh, we are a well-managed city. I, this is the lowest let me put it, this is the lowest headcount number, I believe, since 2001. I don't know how many cities can uh, say that and still operate at the highest level of productivity and efficiency, so I commend staff for that. I do want to say, uh, all era of good feelings here, uh, what, keeps, what remains to keep me up at night with almost a nightmare, <laughs> bad dreams, is our 
$300 million unfunded pension liability. So as we go forward, we have solid plans we're working on, thanks to the Fresh Start, thanks to the Finance Committee's continued work on this with through actuarial studies and council. But we will, going forward, have to continue to reconcile and, and juggle these competing priorities to maintain a quality city uh, in every sense and continue to invest and make this city desirable to live, work, and play. But we do have a significant, because I don't think the state of California or the California legislature, too bad you're not up there, Mr. Curry, <laughs> they could do something about, nobody talks about the unfunded pension liabilities. They talk about well, see what level rise or climate change. I think the only thing that's rising is our unfunded pension liability. Anyway, so uh, we will continue to find, and I appreciate staff working to continue to find structural improvements in how we manage our debt and manage our obligations, and while we drive, continue to drive increased revenues through property tax, uh, sales tax, transit occupancy tax, and other uh, revenue sources that we have, not income taxes, and continuing to invest and build in a quality community. So I see there are other speakers, so I'll end my little speech, but I will be supporting this budget, and thanks to the unanimous vote of the Finance Committee. Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to compliment my uh, appointee to the uh, Finance Committee, still here at 10 o'clock, and uh, all the, you know, the volunteers that, that, that go through this process. And um, I just wanted to make sure that I, I gave him a heads up for that. I, I don't, I, I think that uh, he's brilliant. Obviously, he went, got through Stanford in three years. But I, another side of me says, that's kind of stupid. Why'd you do that? You had a whole other year you could have played around. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm a C student, college dropout, who needed a guidance from someone like this, so I really, really appreciate his time and effort. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Piotr. Thanks, Madam Mayor, and thanks for the Finance Committee and all their hard work. You know, although I'm disappointed in a couple of the things, like the unnecessary commitment on the fresh start or the fact that we didn't cut taxes, I, like you, agree that the unfunded pension liabilities are a huge issue in the city, that we need to do something about it, and I'm, I'm glad that the, uh, the budget is, is, has come as far as it has. Uh, I'm glad that the Finance Committee is is committed to hiring an actuary and to look at financial uh, reform. So uh, for that reason, for those reasons, I'm happy to support the budget. Uh, Mr. Muldoon, Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon. Thank you. Uh, in addition to Duffield, I almost called you Duffy, Councilman Duffield, being grateful to his appointee, Will O'Neill, I'm also grateful to my appointee, John Warner. And... Uh, I think this budget is great because it's get back to basics. And I agree with uh, Mayor Dixon. We're looking at um, trouble ahead with this unfunded pension liability. So uh, I stay committed to working on paying down that debt, whether it's directly to CalPERS or through a special fund. Thank you. Mr. Curry. I want to thank my colleagues for their kind words. And I want to add my personal thanks to the Finance Committee. I think everybody really did a very good job of being very serious, very studious, and very focused on uh, coming up with good answers. I think uh, each of the members of the committee brought something to the table, and I think this budget is the result of their good works. Uh, we haven't actually voted on an actuary. That comes up Tuesday at, or Thursday at the Finance Committee. We'll talk about that idea. But I think we've, we've talked through this process about the challenges the city faces, but we're in fundamentally very good shape. And uh, as long as we continue to be good stewards and act responsibly, uh, we'll continue to be in good uh, financial shape. So I uh, applaud my colleagues on the Finance Committee, each and every one of them, for their support and leadership as we've gone through this process. All right, let's call for the vote. Can I pile on one more? I'm sorry, Madam sure. Mayor. Um, it's, this is my chance to thank the hard work of the staff uh, led by Dan um, Matusiewicz and Steve Montano and Susan Giangrande. They put in countless hours working on this, lots of uh, time beyond 5 o'clock. And then also Dave Webb and Jamie Copeland and Mark Vukovic for the hard work on the CIP and the department directors for all that they do to implement this. So I thank you for that. Very good. And, and I concur. Let's call for the vote. And we're voting in favor of the budget. The motion carries unanimously 7-0. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're not done yet, folks. Uh, item number 24, public hearing for the 2015 Urban, Management, Urban Water Management Plan. 
George promises me we'll go real quick. Actually, maybe we need to take a quick break. Yeah, yeah, let's do recess, yeah. yeah. Number 24, public hearing for the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan. Mr. Murdoch. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. In the interest of time, I'd like to introduce Stefan Catron, our utilities manager in charge of the water system. Uh, we'll have a really brief introduction here and then before your public hearing, and he'll be available to answer questions about the Urban Water Management well, Plan. Let me just ask, have all members of the Council read the staff report? Do we need... I don't think I'm Mr. Stefan. Okay. <laughs> I think sure. you're off the hook. So yeah, right. let's uh, turn it over to the public. Any questions on the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan? All right. So my name is Susan Skinner, and tonight you guys are going to start to review the Newport Beach Urban Water Management Plan. It's a review of our water resources and what strategies we're going to use to ensure that there's enough water to meet supplies in the future. But more importantly, it appears that the Urban Water Management Plan is also the legal tool that allows the city to approve developments by certifying that adequate water supplies exist for such developments. So inaccurate data about water supplies could potentially result in water shortage for the city. Some of you on the dais may tonight may think that climate change is a hoax, but 97% of climate scientists think that it's real. And I believe that it's very likely that water is going to become our most valuable resource in the future and that frequent drought is our new normal. If we define drought as inadequate water supplies for existing needs, we don't even need climate change for permanent drought. We can build our way into that. There are 4,069 new homes being produced, per, uh, proposed by developers in Newport Beach, which will use an estimated 558 million gallons of water per year. In an era in which we do not have enough water supplies for existing residents, adding this degree of development just in this year alone would appear to me to be the height of irresponsibility. So let's look at the urban water management plan and how it, and how it anticipates ensuring that there's enough water to go around. We planned to increase the amount of water drawn from groundwater basin by about 10%, but the plan notes that we have been depleting the groundwater by a huge amount in recent years. There is currently an overdraft of 342,000 acre feet in groundwater as of June 2014, two years ago. Um, we purchase imported water. Remember that those with senior water rights take absolute precedent over junior water rights, meaning that this may well be a much rely less reliable source of water with prolonged drought. Reclaimed water, during drought, the amount of water available to reclaim diminishes. So it reduces this as a viable source of water. All of these sources can be reasonably expected to be static or diminish in coming years. The apparent solution of the urban water management plan is that future development will be supported by continued water conservation of current residents. That means that our city is perfectly willing to have every drop of water that I save be generously allocated to the 26-story condo tower being or proposed in Newport Center or other similar developments. The city is also considering purchasing water from the Poseidon de uh, de desalination plant if it ever gets built, but water obtained from desalination is extremely expensive and re would result in water costs going up, effectively a new tax on existing residents to support future growth. You can stand with developers or you can stand with the residents, but in this issue, you cannot stand with both. Thank you. Thank you. And any other public comments? Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. My name is Nancy Skinner. And you know I always have to have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit I have not read this year's urban water management plan. So I'm just going to share my thinking about water with you. I hope you don't mind. And that has to do with uh, desal, desalinization. Last urban water management plan that we had talked about we would have water in the future because we would have the desal, we would have the GWRS, we would have various things. And I really objected at that time that we should count on something that hasn't been built and was quite controversial at the time. It may still be controversial. I'm saying now that desal by Poseidon 
in order to do it, my understanding and everything I've heard about it, must get contracts ahead of time that those who agree to take their water must take it whether you need it or not. So I just want to alert you to that, and hopefully whoever is the um, representative, I think it's Councilman or Tuffle maybe, on the Orange County Water District, is that correct? Orange County Water District is considering joining with the Poseidon people, and the Poseidon people are um, needing to pay their shareholders. The Orange County Water District is a county operation which we respect and, and, and support. Um, if we were ever to have DSAL, I think it would be in our interest to have only the Orange County Water District build it and run it, because I know that it would be done for the benefit of the people, not the shareholders. I, it, the cost of water from a, from a desalinization plant is either two or possibly even more than that times what you would pay for water the way we get it today. So be very careful when it gets to looking or say we have enough water from desal. It will raise your water rates faster than the, the sewer fight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Moser. Uh, uh, my my understanding that this is a state requirement that we cer certify and approve an urban water management plan every five years. And my understanding also is the reason the state has required this for the last five or ten years is to encourage interaction between the water suppliers and those who supply water to them and those they supply the water to. In, in this case, as Mr. Murdoch said earlier, uh, Newport Beach is a water retailer, so the people that this agency supplies water to are the residents, you and I. And in view of that, short of this public hearing, I don't think there's been a whole lot of interaction produced by this process between the city as a water supplier and the residents who the water is being supplied to. In particular, as far as I know, the, the plan has not even been reviewed by the residents who you appointed to our Water Quality Coastal Tidelands Committee. I, I find that rather peculiar. Had it been looked at and reviewed to them, uh, I, I think some, suggest some improvements to it might have been suggested. One improvement I would suggest is the document would be a lot more user-friendly if at the beginning of it, it had an executive summary that told us what key points we should be looking at in reading it, what the important parts of it are. As best I can tell, it's missing that, and it would be improved at the end if it had conclusions telling us what we concluded after doing this planning and study. Uh, I, I, for one, looking at it, I tried to look at it. I found it very unwieldy. I don't know if it's telling us we're in a water crisis or it's telling us that we have no problem at all. But I, I just kind of looked at random pages. One random page I looked at was page 2-6, which was telling us whether we understand where, whether we have losses from our system, which is apparently based on how much we purchase from suppliers and how much we can account for through the water meters and so forth. And I gathered we have a considerable uncertainty about it because the report says that our city has a data validity score of only 61 out of 100. And I'm kind of wondering what that's telling us about how we run our water system, if our data validity, how, how well, I, I don't even know for sure what the term means, but 61 out of 100 doesn't sound like a great score. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? My name is Bernadette McCann, and I'm a resident. Um, and I didn't come here tonight about this particular matter, but I do have very strong feelings as a resident who took it quite to heart when we got the request to reduce our water consumptions by about 30%. I am... Um, unhappy to find out that yes, our hard won conservation efforts will be handed over to necessarily, you know, new development in some of these things. I'd like to read the document, but mainly what I want to bring up is the disconnect between some of our city codes in not allowing residents to use gray water 
um, or giving city residents any kind of alternative for some very simple alternatives in which to reduce our consumption. Our personal household took our, and I love when the city started sending us the emailed reports um, giving us benchmarks across our neighbors or to even help us understand what our consumption was and suggestions on what we could do. Our family has gone from, I think, using in that report off the top of my head about over 300 down to, I think, on average, 120. So we, and this is a household of four, and invariably would have a friend living on and off, so potentially five children, over a 10,000 square foot lot that needed irrigation, so a ginormous lot for this city size of landscaping. Um, and we were able to take down our water usage by doing that, by having the personal responsibility of um, saving bath water, putting that in the toilet tank, um, doing a bucketing out water from the bathtub to um, irrigate our landscape, um, which some of the council members have seen even has vegetables, um, and, and doing all this manually because I'm outlawed from doing a gray water system that would allow me to take very reusable bath water and use it directly in my toilet, which are two of the highest water consumptions based upon their own reports that you send to my home every month. A simple, simple fix. But I'm outlawed and it's illegal for a plumber to help me do this in a more easily way in which maybe some of my other neighbors might adopt. So it's just food for thought, haven't read the report, would love a report that would make sense to just the average user so that we could make fixes that can make dramatic water differences in our community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, do we want to address or wait till the, why don't we wait till the end of all the comments and we'll address these questions. Yes, ma'am, please come forward. Madam Mayor, city council members, my name is Sharon Koch and I'm a long time resident of the city of Newport Beach. In the interest of full disclosure, I am also chair of the Angeles chapter of the Sierra Club, which covers all of the members of the Sierra Club in both Orange and LA counties. The Urban Water Management Plan is one of the most important documents that this council can address, and I'm extremely disappointed that your public hearing on the council did not begin until 10 o'clock at night on an evening when you had many other important items to discuss. I would hope that you would continue to have a public hearing again on the Urban Water Management Plan before you finally approve it, that you make it more accessible to the public, and that you do take into very close and careful due consideration what our future water resources are, and take those into consideration when you consider future development we will not have the water available. We cannot rely upon desalination as being an answer. And if we do take that as an answer, we need to recognize that the proposal before the Orange County Water District is to allow them a 50-year option, not even an option, a requirement for 50 years that the OCWD will buy all of the water from the Poseidon desal plant at a premium price and with a built-in increase each year for Poseidon. It's not an acceptable option. It's not an acceptable item for you to consider when you look at future water supply. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any other public comments? Um, George and Dave, could you please clarify what we are doing tonight? Because it says here that we are going to be returning to the June 28th council meeting. So what kind of direction are you looking for? Uh, nothing, just, just that uh, input from the council and the public. Uh, regarding the urban water management plan, we did introduce it about three weeks ago. Uh, it's up on our web, as you know, uh, to get public feedback and any comments. Um, and then we will come back in two weeks for an adoption um, and we could accept any of your comments. If you'd like, I could respond to a couple things real quickly from, from what we've heard. So ten, uh, five years ago in a 2010 urban water management plan, the Poseidon project was mentioned. 
because Poseidon at the time was looking for end user customers, cities and agencies to purchase the water. Since that time, of course, they're, they're working with the Orange County Water District, so it took the agencies out of the loop. It is mentioned in the Urban Water Management Plan that they are working with, with the Orange County Water District, uh, but that has nothing to do with us and our interaction with, with Poseidon. Um, Jim Mosier's comments on executive summar summaries and a conclusion, good idea, we'll talk to the consultant. Unfortunately, the state mandates what that urban water management plan must look like. Uh, each section has to be addressed and it must look and feel the same throughout the entire state. So, but we'll ask, maybe there's something we can, there's some wiggle room there. Uh, the validity score, so this isn't a, a grade that's an A, B, C, or we got a D. Uh, in fact, over 40% is good, and I'll explain why. Validity, uh, when looking at leaks, is how can you validate what that, where that water went? So if we meter a leak, uh, we know how much there, it's, it's a valid um, um, amount of water that was metered. Whereas if a fire hydrant is hit, we have to estimate how much water is lost. We don't know. So they give you a poor, a, a lower validity score um, on leaks and if you don't calibrate uh, meters from where we purchase, uh, like the Metropolitan Water District where we purchase our water, uh, if they don't calibrate their meters on a regular basis, then they give a, a score, a lower score. So it, over 40 is actually good. I know that may not, they think 100% um, validity doesn't mean we don't know where the water's going. We know where it's going, it's just hard to quantify um, some of those leaks, main breaks, those kind of things. Um, and then the, the gray water question, um, it's not illegal to have gray water systems. It, you do need a permit if you have a pressurized system. So we'd en encourage the, the customers to come talk to our building department because gray water systems aren't illegal. And I think I covered most. All right, thank you, George. Mr. Petros, you had a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'll, I'll try and be brief here. Uh, going back to the study session, I was making comments on the fact that it is the public perception that how can you ask me to conserve when there's a general plan out there that you're trying to implement? We just heard it tonight. The assertion was that the only way that we are uh, making water available is to overdraft our, our, uh, our supply and on the backs of conservation. Yet in the study session, you have said that both water agencies have a, uh, will serve for the city of Newport Beach. What is the truth? So in, the, in the, the, the wholesalers also have to do an urban water management plan, but in fact, the Orange County Water District, it's a groundwater management plan. And both agencies have indicated that they can meet the supplies in the next three years if there was a drought. Obviously, if there wasn't a drought, they could as well. Um, in our urban water management plan, we do identify what our general plan is in anticipating as projects. Any water supply assessments that were done for developments over 500 units that were done 10 years ago, all of these are, are in our projections when we present those to our wholesalers and say, these are what our demands are gonna be. Can you meet those demands? Um, the tough thing with urban water management plans were initially they were infrastructure, where your pipe's big enough to supply the water. Now it's turned into more of a, it's a drought, it hasn't rained in a long time. The pipes are big enough, but there's not enough water in the pipe. So we, they try to address both situations, um, drought and infrastructure. Um, the general plans and the urban water supply assessments of, and for, regarding developments um, are really looking infrastructure-wise. I don't think they really looked at drought in a drought year. I think so, it is, so it is not true that the only way that we will see our general plan through to completion is on the backs of existing residents and their conservation efforts. No, yeah. We have forecast what our water needs are to get the general plan approved or the general plan implemented. And there is a water supply available regardless of the conservation efforts, there is a water supply available to see the general plan through. All of the that is true. Is all that, the projections are in the urban water management plan and we've Now it's a good idea yeah. to conserve and we ought to be doing that, but it's, I, I, I want to dispel that, that right there that we heard tonight. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, so do we require a vote on this? 
Mr. Um, Mr. Murdoch? No, this, uh, once we conduct the public hearing, then, I'm sorry. You know, if, if, unless you have any direction for us, this was the purpose of tonight's meeting was to take public comment and your comment. Otherwise, we'll bring it back. And if, if staff feels like something should be amended or changed, we'll bring that back with that change. And we come back as a public- 28th as, a, as an acceptance item. Okay, as on the item. consent or on a public? Probably on the consent calendar. Yeah, as an, approved, okay. as an approval, adoption. Okay, all right, I see no questions. So agreed, uh, do we take a vote on that? To no. move it forward, I guess. Or move it forward? Yes, I don't know. Do Return we, item to the June 20th yeah. meeting. That right. would be yeah. part, part C there. Oh, and the CEQA finding. So moved. Second? Second. Okay, let's vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Okay, I'm going to uh, exercise a little mayor prerogative here. If um, seeing Mrs. McCann, Mr. and Mrs. McCann in the audience, in, uh, in the interest of their time, if we could advance item number 31 for discussion and move it to public discussion. So bike pedestrian safety around schools and other areas. A gentleman here, Mr. Gavin Sachs has been also waiting patiently for item 25, so. With this consultants. Well, all right, we could dispense with item 25 here because isn't that going back to the planning commission? Okay, well, stand by on 31. Let's just quickly do item number 25, which is the next item, and then we'll move to 31. All right, staff, do you want to make uh, a statement <laughs> report on that, please? Of course. Good evening, Mayor um, Dixon, members of the council. I'm Kim Brandt, Community Development Director. The item before you is a, an appeal of a planning commission decision that was made back in December 2015. There was a variance and mo um, modification permit um, proposed in conjunction with the construction of a new home in the Newport Heights area on Catalina and La Jolla. In the ensuing months, the, um, the applicant has revised their proposal and we are and has submitted their revised plans to the staff and we are recommending that given this new information that the the application be referred back to the planning commission for their re review and recommendations back to city council so the project will come back to you after planning commission's um, a review and recommendation all right very good do we have any questions up here uh, madam mayor i'll move that we refer it back to the planning commission Second. all right do we need a public discussion on this any matter, members of the public wish to speak on this item, going back to the Planning Commission? You don't have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a hint? <laughs> good evening. Uh, thank you for um, all the good work this evening. Uh, my name is Gavin Sachs, 336 Catalina Drive. I just have a few uh, brief questions in respect of the due process of these kind of matters going through the city council and planning commission. First question is the um, planning staff is, is recommending that the case be uh, uh, reheard by planning commission. That would imply that there is a materiality to the new plans that address some of the, the reasons for denial of the initial submission. Um, obviously the plans have changed. Uh, my question for you is, are they, have they changed in a material enough way to just flippantly or not, excuse me, that's disrespectful, not flippantly, but just to presume that the changes are material enough to rehear the whole case. Um. So that's a decision that the council will be making that they want additional input from the planning commission on the project as revised. But the, the additional information is to go back to the planning commission, not the council, right? Council's had a, a staff memo that had what, three paragraphs? So it would go back to the planning commission for further consideration, that's right. Does the applicant have any representatives here this evening? Um, Madam Mayor, there is a representative from for the so applicant. So what is well for your have your three minutes or now a minute and forty seconds? Just continue to finish your question, and then if there's anyone who wants to speak, they may speak. Okay, no, I'm I'm just trying to understand the process a little bit a little bit better. Thank you. Uh, We'd be happy to meet with you later, but if you want to continue with your public comments, if you just have general questions, we can meet with you afterwards and kind of talk about process. 
Uh, I think I'm okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Moser. I, I'm also trying to understand the process because I thought that when this matter was originally before the Planning Commission, they had the authority just to approve it. It would not normally be coming to the City Council. So I'm asking for clarification. If, if you refer this back to the Planning Commission, couldn't they approve it? And if they did, it would not be coming back to you? Is, am I missing something? It, it, it says it's for a modification permit and a variance. Those normally don't go to the City Council. It's here only because it's being appealed. So I would think it could go back and be settled at the Planning Commission. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments? Um, Mr. City Attorney or Mr. Kiff or Ms. Brandt, do you want to comment on process? <laughs> we have had this uh, type of application before where there is an appeal and there's a substantial change to the proposal and where the City Council has referred it back to the Planning Commission. Because this is an appeal to the City Council, you have the option to refer that new information back to the Council to the Planning Commission for, for their consideration. The applicant is paid an appeal, fee, an appeal fee, and so if the Planning Commission were to take an action and then an interested party or the applicant would then have to file a new appeal application and come back right back to the City Council. So the, the process is to refer back to the Planning Commission for their review and recommendation and then bring it back to the City Council for the, for action on the appeal. So we're going to get it back regardless. It will come back to you, and all the information that has been submitted will come back to you, Mr. but with the benefit of the Planning Commission's recommendation. Yes, on the revised plan. Mr. Petros. Yeah, I would, uh, I'm, I'm supportive of the motion, and I'd like to move this along, but I would like to make sure that the Planning Commission uh, in their original action, they had, I believe, eight issues that they found to deny the project. The application, as it has been revised, includes two fixes, <laughs> a driveway lengthening and a new side gate. I want to make sure that the Planning Commission reviews all of the matters, not just those two, but all of them before they render their decision. That would be... That would be the case, yes. Thank you. All right, so noted. So let's call for the vote to move this back to the Planning Commission. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right. Um, let's, if we may, um, proceed to item 31. Uh, we have Mr. and Mrs. McCann here, so thank you very much for being here this evening, and this matter is very important to all of us in the community so that we can improve bike safety on our streets and sidewalks. Mr. Petros, did you, or the staff, do you want to speak first and then Ms. Very briefly, Madam Mayor. So this item would, um, as you see in the staff report, um, ask the city to, uh, with our public works staff and our police staff and a number of other individuals from different groups, including a representative of McCann's, uh, take some more time and spend um, a new effort uh, looking at safe routes to and from school with an initial focus on the Newport Heights area. Thank you. Um, Mr. Petros, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I want to, first of all, just uh, commend the McCanns for being here, uh, for being the kind of people that, dang it, for being the, the kind of people that you are. Um, it was, uh, you did me a great service by uh, allowing me into your home and sharing the time with me. Uh, we at the city uh, have a bicycle master plan. The number one item in that plan is safety. Uh, and yet this happened. Um, I don't necessarily believe that, uh, you know, these things like the tragedies like this occur. Uh, I do think that when something like this happens that we do need to take pause and look at ways to avoid this again. Um, there are a number of items that Mr. Kiff and I and Mr. Webb already identified in my traffic engineering expertise that we can start to look at uh, to make 
bicycling and children safer around all the schools. We're going to start in the Heights because let's start small. And then if we can duplicate this around other places like Newport L and other places, that's great. Uh, I am encouraged to do this. Um, I, this is what I do for a living and I will do everything I can to uh, advance uh, initiatives uh, as we move forward. Um, and I just want to say what a blessing you are to me personally, and thank you. Uh, do we have any other comments up here? Um, any public comments? Did you uh, want? I would move the item then, Madam right. Mayor. Wait, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, come please. Uh, hello, my name is Robert Schacht. I'm a, a father of three and live in the Heights. And I had a few moments to read part of the, the 2014 Master Bike Plan. And it's done many, many wonderful things to the city, tremendous things on the peninsula, many great places to ride bikes, uh, particularly for families. But I certainly think that it did not do enough in the Heights. Um, without a doubt, if you are in the area, you know, particularly I live on the corner of Aliso and Clay, where all three schools kind of converge in there. It's complete mayhem at times, and there is truly nowhere to ride your bike at all. And if you look at the bike racks, even at the heights and, you know, the, the middle schools and high schools, obviously those kids are older, can take care of themselves. There's not many kids that ride bikes anyways. And to me, that's kind of sad in an area, in a tight-knit neighborhood where kids should have that opportunity to do it safely, to ride it to school if they're the appropriate age. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many of my neighbors live five and six blocks away from the school and they choose not to walk or ride their bikes. You know, I mean, that, that also adds to the congestion in the area. Um, but I really encourage you guys to do a lot. You know, you, you obviously with uh, Mr. Kiff and Mr. Petros have uh, great people with a lot of knowledge and you know personal interests and professional interests in doing the right thing. But I encourage you to do a lot and to act quickly and make significant changes so that the residents and the citizens don't have to you know come in here with a couple hundred people all upset that not enough has been done. I just encourage you guys to do it, to do it now, and to make significant changes in the heights and and obviously uh, really help our, our community out. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, Mayor Dixon and council members. I'm Gina Sarita. I live on 522 Riverside Avenue. I've got two children that are at the Heights, dear friends to the McCanns. And obviously this is such a grave issue that has to be focused on, you know, I'm not going to, because of the late hour, there's so many things that I think need to be addressed, particularly in the Heights with regard to bike and, um, bike safety, crossing guards, um, just the volume of children on the main thoroughfare of 15th street. Just, there's just so many issues, but I just really want to emphasize, I hope this is going to I'm going to be part of the the committee um, helping the McCanns. I'm just hoping this is going to be focused on quickly, and that's what I'm hoping to get some comments on back. What's going to be the timeline? Is this a in six months or a year? Or I just would really like to know the speed at the um, the focus safety task group. I guess you could call it is going to proceed at. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Summer Harding. I'm the principal of Newport Heights Elementary. And I want to speak on behalf of the McCann family and our entire school community and say our hearts were broken when we lost Brock. Um, I also want to thank publicly the police and the fire department for all the support that they gave to our school along with the district support that I received. I think it went a long way towards bringing the community together in their grief and their sadness and supporting the McCann family. So I encourage you to look at this issue on behalf of all the children at Newport Heights and to publicly thank all the first responders in the city and how they helped us. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? 
Real quickly, Madam Mayor, yes. in response to Gina's yes. comment, I, I would love to get some stuff going right before the school year starts again, so that's a short amount of time. So is in terms of the staff report and those uh, num numerous items bullet pointed, so you former, we'll get to work right away. Former committee. Yep. Get, all right. Let's call for the vote. We have a second. Motion carries unanimously, 7 0. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, let me go back to item number 26 resolution to renew the Corona Del Mar Business District for fiscal year 2016 and 17 and advisory board appointments. For it is a late hour, so we'll let you pass on the staff report if you'd like. Move right. the item. Second. That's called, oh, public comment, please, on item number 26. Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name again is Jim Moser. I had several comments on this. You have two companion items, which are uh, both resolutions renewing business improvement districts, one Corona Del Mar, one for the Newport Beach Restaurant Association. Um, since, since your last meeting, both of those business improvement district boards met, and I, I wanted to point out that it, both of them there was some self-congratulation that the bids had been renewed, and I wanted to point out that your action at the last meeting was not the renewal. You were just looking at their plan for the next year, and tonight is technically the hearing at which the renewal would take place or not take place. I had a couple of comments about the specific actions here, and in both of these, action number four is to for you to appoint a complete board of directors I wanted to point out, as I have in past years, that this is based on a myth that somewhere in state law there is a requirement that annually you, you appoint an entire board to the bid business improvement district. Uh, there is no such requirement in the state law. It simply says that the city council has to appoint the board. And if you look at our city charter, it wisely says that when you're appointing a board that they should have uh, staggered four-year terms so that you get continuity from year to year instead of just replacing the entire board each year. So I wanted to point that out. And then the, unlike the normal renewal, there is an item here, actions D and E, having to do with changing the funding to the bid and authorizing a contract for bookkeeping services. Uh, it's a little confusingly written here, uh, but basically what this boils down to is that the city has been charging the bids for the last couple of years, $20,000 for accounting services, and they found that they were only costing the city approximately $10,000. So the bid is asking for the basically 10000 back well, actually, they're asking for 20000 back, and then they would pay the expense of this. What I wanted to say is the next one coming up, the Restaurant Association wanted to stay with the city accounting system at a cost of 10000 and to get their $10,000 back. This one here before the Corona Del Mar bid, I think should be set aside because it was improperly handled at the meeting, which I attended. The public was told at the beginning of the meeting that they could provide no input on this. Uh, Councilman Piotr was there, who is not a member of the board, and although the public had been told at the very beginning of the meeting that that was the time to speak, during the discussion of this, Councilman Piotr acted as if he was a member of board and told them the only option that they would, would be approved by the city council would be the one of the outsourcing and not staying with the city council, which forces the restaurant association then into the option, which is not their preference. I think that was improper. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Any, any other public comments? Seeing none. Um, any comments up here? Seeing none. I'd like to just make a comment from my knowledge of the bids. Uh, I would like to include in the motion, if you will, that uh, I will support the recommended action, but I would like the bid and the city staff to look at the pros and cons of moving towards the 1994 
property-based improvement law, which I think has more advantages to the business owners and a lower cost to the city for a number of reasons. It's a five-year review process uh, and a number of other aspects. So um, that would be my amended motion to look at all, there's, the state law has been updated, and Mr. Mosier may be right in terms of some of that, that I think we're... Uh, we should be looking at that before we renew it again in a year. <laughs> is, 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 does that make but sense if to you? That's Mr. an addition to the rest of the motion. That's clear yes. to me. Yes. Yes. Sounds like deja vu all over again. <laughs> You've been <laughs> down this road. You've been down there. Okay. Uh, let's. Well, I guess that was my motion. Do we have a second to my motion? I'll second. All right. Call for the vote. Motion carried unanimously, 7-0. All right, <coughs> item number 27, the renewal of the Newport Beach Restaurant Association Business District for fiscal year 2016. Name offer to avoid a staff report. All right, uh, any public comment? Oh, we we need, we need one. <laughs> Good evening. It's, it's been late, and in, uh, in the essence of time, uh, Mayor Dixon and City Council. Um, my name is Jim Walker. I'm president of the Newport Beach Restaurant Association. Um, we do have a presentation, uh, but we would like to defer that, if that's all right with you. Um, in the es essence of time, we would only request that you do renew our bid and give us the opportunity to continue to grow the restaurant community in Newport Beach. Thank you. Any Let's bring it back up here. Any, first of all, any other public comments? Seeing none, bring it back up here. Any comments from the council? I will just make a comment. I want to uh, commend how the uh, Restaurant Association bid has been working with Newport Beach Company. I think your marketing is really successful. Went through your staff report, the report, a lot of growth for our local businesses and putting Newport Beach on the map of Restaurant Week and all that you're doing. It's The marketing is, is really... Excellent, so thank you. So, call for the vote. Motion carried unanimously, 7-0. All right, under current business, item number 28, Irvine Avenue Pavement and Median Rehabilitation, awarding of a contract. Move the item. What's the same as 50 yards? Public comment? Yes, I have comments. All right, <laughs> a member of the public. I don't see any public, so is it okay if I sp you yes, bring it back? Yes, go right ahead, please. Um, this thing right now includes landscaping to the tune of almost $500,000. Uh, you know, we right now the, the irrigation's turned off, the turf is de dead in there. Uh, we're reconstructing the street, so part of the reconstructing of the street is to install drought-tolerant landscaping. Uh, I would suggest that uh, you know, we're in the drought. Let's not put in landscaping. I would prefer either to go with wood chips or hydro seed it in some sort of a low uh, drought tolerant uh, plant material that stays green. Just a simple ground cover. Uh, this is this is not a uh, you know signature element entry element into the city. And let's spend the money someplace else. Uh, staff's initial uh, estimate was about sixty thousand dollars to just do the grading and and some sort of a wood chip. I'm not sure if the the irrigation is already existing, so we wouldn't be changing or charging that. Uh, but to go to a simple hydro seed would be a, a whole lot less expensive. So I would like to change that. I mean, frankly, we're in a drought, and if it took us ten years to replace the turf, people would understand that we're in the process of changing the turf. Uh, if we went to some simple landscaping that just was green and didn't require much modification of the irrigation, it would save us a whole lot of money. So I would recommend that the staff change the landscaping to either a simple drought tolerant single ground cover or in the form of a hydro seed or go to wood chips. Okay, uh, Mr. Petros. Well, in fact, this is a signature entry into the city of Newport Beach. It is coming in uh, from one of only two locations. No, 
Yeah, one of two locations uh, on the west side, right adjacent to the upper Newport Bay, a signature landmark of open space and natural environment to the city. And in fact, the notion of the landscaping here is drought tolerant, which will be uh, low water you, uh, yielding, much like the improvements on Dover further south near Coast Highway. So if the concern is water consumption, the water consumption will be diminished dramatically. And if you want to make something just hideously ugly, let's put some wood chips down on one of the most beautiful uh, painted artistic spot spots in the city, Irvine Avenue. I would say let's continue on. The, the motion has been made and seconded, and let's move forward. Any other comments? I'll make a substitute motion. Change the landscaping out to a drought tolerant hydro seed. Yeah, I'll second that. You second it? Okay, what is a drought tolerant hydro seed? There's probably a mix, and Mark may know, but um, there are various flower mixes and things that you can put down. They'll grow usually as a, a ground cover, maybe, that we could find. Um, I don't know the exact mix, and I don't know if you'd want to review the mixes. Is this going to compromise the overall look and feel? Well, there's a couple of wrinkles that come into play here because we have a pretty favorable bid, but this is a significant item in it. So if we reject that part of it, probably with the contracting code, and you can correct me on that, Mark, but I think we might have to reject these bids and come back and rebid the project because it changes the scope. Um, this is a substantial amount of money in that. Um, the other thing that I advise, is that I understand from Ma, this is one of our older medians, so the, the irrigation system in it works, as I understand, needs maintenance, but it's an older system. At some point, we're going to have to come back and replace that, so the work you're going to put in is going to be disturbed again. So if you want to just save time and money, as Scott mentioning, maybe wood chips, and that defers it, um, again, we'll probably have to rebid it, but the other side of it is if you want to do it right for a long term, like we've done on most of our medians, you'd want to go with the ultimate landscaping and irrigation system. So the irrigation is included in this? This is included. The irrigation cost in this, Mark, do you remember the number? I think it's about 200 and something, 282000 Yeah. And then there's about $234,000 for the landscaping cost. All right, and you're doing this with the drought tolerant... Yeah. Okay. Yes, let's, this would be for the concept that you saw originally that was yeah. approved. All right, uh, Mr. Duffield. Well, I just wanted to point out that um, <clears throat> you know the, the perception we've had people come up to talk tonight about you know saving water and all this. Why do they have to? And all of a sudden, you know, we're and we've you know I think we've done a heck of a job in medians, Dover Drive and the Peninsula everywhere. There's just a huge amount of median work. And I'm just wondering, you know, I'm not, I don't think we're saying make it ugly, but I think we could, you know, put it, kind of defer it with this uh, method. And, and eventually when we do get out of the drought, we could, or we can get some more budgeting uh, because we just spent so much money. And I, I thought I heard from uh, Mr. Kiff that there was um, some good savings here if we, if we just um, tweak this a little bit. And, and I'm, not, I'm not an expert on all that, but I sure would like to offer that up um, for those two reasons. I think, and Dave can help me here, if the quote that I gave you, I think is indeed like a, about a, a, it's probably a $450,000 reduction if you don't do the irrigation. Um, the question would be, if you hydro seed with something, do you need to irrigate that? And I think that's Dave and Mark's point that the status of the irrigation right now isn't great. So the, I think my brain was going towards a wood chip thing that you didn't have to irrigate. But maybe Dave or Mark could correct me if that's wrong. Mr. Petros, did you want to say something? I, well, this is being penny wise and pound foolish. The cost of the median is roughly 200 for the, the irrigation and the actual median itself, and the landscaping is the other, the remainder of the cost. We risk losing the total bid package. This, it's not just like, oh, we'll swap this out and swap this in. The whole thing has to go back out to bid. And when we do that, we lose time. We lose the, the time-based bid increments. So you, we are not saving anything. We are making something ugly. That's what it is. 
All right. Uh, no further comments. Let's call for the question. It's well, so on the Ms. substitute motion. Mr. Piotr had a substitute. Oh, okay. And it, I, Ms., I, it may involve a rebid, but what, what if you, if Mr. Piotr's motion passes, it would be its direction to staff to resolve that in a manner that involves hydro seeding uh, instead of the landscaping plan and probably a rebid. Yeah, I wouldn't approve the contract. I'd give us direction. We'll have to negotiate with the contractor to see if we can actually award this. It's probably significant. With council members Curry, Petros, and Mayor Dixon voting no, the motion carries 4 3. Okay, uh, number 29, sewer main lining and sewer main lining and repairs. Mr. Webb. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sort of processing that. Mr. Mark. <laughs> Mark, would you like to give the staff report? Can, can I just ask for clarification on, on, the, on the vote? Did we approve a contract or did we? Okay, thank you. We'll do specs and probably a rebid. Okay, so we'll, we'll repackage it with a different palette and, and, and bid it. Okay. Um, Mr. Curry has just moved the item. Any second? Any comments? Any public comments? Call for the vote. Motion carries unanimously, 7 0. Uh, number 30, auditor recommendation. Any second? Any comments? Any public comments? I bet we have one. <laughs> Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Moser. My final comment tonight on this item. It's auditor recommendation. It, it's actually the recommendation. First, first thing I wanted to point out, as I pointed out to the Finance Committee, if you read our city charter, the auditor, this is a selection for somebody to audit the city's books for the fiscal year that is going to end at the end of this month. And the city charter actually appears to say that the auditor is supposed to be selected at the beginning of the fiscal year, not at its end. But this is the way we've been doing it. Beyond that, this recommendation is to stay with the same auditor, White, Nelson, Deal, Evans, that the city has been using for the last five years. Uh, we have a city council policy that suggests that at the end of five years, we should consider whether we should select a new auditor for the coming years or stick with the one that we already had. Uh, it gives the council the option under that policy to continue for another five years. After 10, it's pretty much mandatory to change them. I understand from people who have spoken to me that in the corporate world, the tendency is to think that you should stay with the same auditor for some time. You get a relationship or something. I would want to point out that this is not the corporate world. This is public money that we're talking about, a public institution. And I think the public's perception of the way our finances are being looked at is improved if we change auditors frequently so that the public is assured that we have new eyes looking at our city finances and make a frequent change. So I would suggest rejecting this and looking for a new auditor rather than sticking with the one we had for the last five years. Thank you. Mr. Piotr. Um, you know, taking for the fact that I am financially illiterate and just a dumb architect, uh, I agree with Mr. Mosier. The auditor may be doing a fantastic job, but I'd like a fresh set of eyes on it. I don't have the time, maybe Mr. Curry does, but I don't have the time to go and look at every single uh, you know, account entry that our city finance department makes, and I know that's not quite how far down this auditor goes. Um, but I think we ought to have a fresh set of eyes. And so I would move that we take the second firm of Davis Farr instead of White Nelson, Deal, and Evans. I'll second that. All right, Mr. Curry, do you have a comment? Well, uh, much as with some of Mr. Piotr's other recommendations, the recommendation for the auditor was carefully and thoughtfully reviewed by the Finance Committee, and both uh, it was unanimously supported. 
Yeah. So your appointee, Mr. Piotta, and Mr. Duffields voted, uh, whom we've all laid in praise on tonight, uh, voted to move forward with this. We questioned why with the second firm, there were significant legitimate reasons why that was uh, not recommended. Uh, and I think actually they're more expensive. Uh, and uh, we had uh, a, a good discussion, and this is the recommendation of the Finance Committee uh, based on the review of your appointees. And I think you've ac accurately uh, dis you know, described your financial acumen here, and I think we ought to uh, follow the Finance Committee's recommendation, the staff's careful RFP process, and not try and willy-nilly come in here and pick favorites and substitute people through the RFP process and get ourselves known as a reputation where on any given day, if you can muster four votes, you can overturn the objective of procurement processes followed by the city. You want to talk about a corrupt practice, that's the one that everybody knows about. Uh, Mr. Piotr. I forget, are you willy or am I nilly? <laughs> uh, Mr. Kiff, can you, do you have a preference one way or the other? How does it affect the city and its performance? Obviously, you've gone through the procurement process and, and you recommended either firm to the Dan, finance committee. Dan, can you show the rankings? So uh, this was the ranking that we uh, went through and, and showed the finance committee. Um, it's, it's close, obviously. Um, I, I think staff's belief was that this was a good process, but we also understand, and this is the summary of why um, the staff proposed White Nelson D. Evans. So you have one point difference, and they're actually, like Mr. Curry pointed out, a little bit more expensive than the second place firm. So money's not the issue. And obviously the ranking is not the, the issue is one being different. So uh, I'm, I'm Willie, he's Nilly. I really want a new fresh set of eyes. Mr. Muldoon, Mayor Pro Dem. Thank you, the RFP process is not holy and sacred. Uh, so I believe <laughs> we can uh, reserve the right to vote how we, how we choose, but I'm thinking go with the recommendation, but next year have some fresh eyes on it. Um, this is a five-year contract? Is this a five-year contract? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, we usually uh, do our auditor agreements for five years. Okay, so when the charter says... Um, we, touch it, at most, uh, our policy suggests that um, at most someone can go five years and then with one five-year renewal, but they must rotate the principles so that you have a new person from that firm overseeing the audit, and that is the case with White Nelson. Oh, okay. And, and I will say in my public company experience, I mean, the rotation of the audit partner supervisor, it's very normal after a period of time. Um, and also, no one has mentioned, but in that review, the um, other firm that came in second, the White, or the Davis Farr, somehow many of their partners were formally connected with the auditing firm that looked at the city of Bell. And so there were, the staff has recommended that we just have some more time here with this, with stay with White and let Davis Farr get up to speed and, and White Nelson has been in business serving municipal entities for over 80 years, I guess. So I will, let's call for, do we have a motion? And a second. There's a substitute Excuse motion. Excuse me, I had a substitute motion. Oh, we had a, a substitute motion. Okay, so let's vote on the substitute motion. With Mayor Pro, Pro Tem Muldoon, Council Members Curry, Mayor Dixon, Council Members Petros and Selig voting no, the motion fails 2 5. All right, so we have an alternative motion. Yes, okay. With Council Members Duffield and Petro Piotr voting no, the motion carries 5 2. Okay, Madam Clerk. Motion for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any item there? Okay. We are going to adjourn this evening in the memory of young Brock McCann. And Mr. Petros, do you have a comment? Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> These have been extremely challenging days for our community and our nation. Here in Newport Beach, we lost Brock McCann. I didn't know him, and I wish I did. 
I want to tell you about Brock, as shown to me by his family. He was a piano player, a bongo drum player, a brother, a son, a member of a wonderful family, a friend, a classmate, a student, a sketch artist. He was excellent with crayons. He loved crazy hats. He and his dad hunted coyotes in Castaways Park, an early part of our hazing efforts there. He was a Nerf gun rifleist, a football player, a best friend of many, including legions of his, including legions of his classmates, and to a beloved cat and two dogs. He was a happy soul, a carefree soul, a silly soul, and he was only eight, eight years old. Today, more than ever, the world needs more Brock McCanns. He's not here with us, though, and that's heaven's gain, but it's our monumental loss. We adjourn this meeting in his honor and hope that his spirit carries with us forever. Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you all for staying in to the very end. Thank you.